second. I'll let you know. <clears throat> I will let you know. We have a little, tiny little bit of a delay. So as soon as I note that um, we are live, And I think we are live. Wonderful. So yeah, if you can, um, if you would be kind enough to go ahead and uh, and pray for us, Kateri, uh, I would greatly appreciate that. We can uh, we can get going talking about uh, all things Trinitarian this evening. If you don't mind praying for us, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to know your Son Jesus, and we ask you to send us at this time the Holy Spirit as we go towards Pentecost. We ask, we ask you to, um, to lead us in this discussion tonight <clears throat> and to help us understand more fully your great mysteries. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for that very, very uh, wonderful prayer there, uh, Katri. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And Sam will be joining us momentarily for people that are tuning in. I will, in the meantime, pop up my YouTube and uh, look and see if anybody has any comments. So we are live. We've got a few people watching, tuning in already. What are we going to be looking at tonight? So we're going to continue. As you note here, I've got a couple of videos already prepped to look at. So we're going to continue digging into um, uh, Ibn Thibn Farouk, whatever uh, his name is. We're going to continue looking at the material that he's put out, where he not only attacks Christianity as a whole, he attacks Protestantism, he attacks Catholicism, he really insults the faith and really goes after Christianity. So we're going to examine a few of the comments that he makes, one particular one, and we're going to rip them apart, I forgot to downvote that other video my bad okay uh so we are gonna look at all the comments that he makes we're gonna examine them the particular arguments that he makes are not good they're not compelling uh they're not impressive at all they're they're actually an insult they're an insult to christianity but he does make it a point to attack catholicism why why catholicism why not orthodox well, he probably doesn't even know about orthodoxy he doesn't even know what catholicism teaches so it's not an insult to my Orthodox brothers and sisters. Uh, he just doesn't know anything about the ancient Christian faith. He doesn't know anything about the Bible, period, which is particularly why he butchers the Bible every time he comes out. So in a moment, our brother Sam will be joining us. We'll look at the terrible arguments that Fib and Farouk continues to put forth that are just really, really bad arguments. One particular one that you're going to hear that he brings up is an attack on John 1. Now, what is the claim that Fib and Farouk loves to make when it comes to John 1? First off, anybody here, anybody here that has done even basic level work in the Bible, any of you all here that are Trinitarians, even if you aren't um, uh, very well versed in theology, anyone here with a surface level knowledge of the christian faith knows john 1 1 knows it pretty well in the beginning was the word and the word is with god and the word was god so people can really even quote it in greek by the way if anybody ever wants a breakdown of that i have a video where i break down the grammar of the greek step by step that whole whole the whole passage here it is a classic passage that evinces the deity of Christ, a classic one. Very evident, there's no way around it. It is one passage, one area, where Fib and Farouk doesn't understand the thing about. So what you note that he does often in his videos, and I'm gonna share my sound, because in a bit we're gonna be looking at the videos and we're gonna be going over them and we're gonna be refuting them, uh, but not until I open my... Diet Coke. There we go. Open and read. Okay. So in John 1, one argument that you're going to hear 
Sibin Farouk used very often, hey, Chloe, how's everybody doing? David, Christine, Kyle, Lolo, I saw the light. I'm just going down the list. I, I am noting, I do notice where everybody, we have close to 300 watching on YouTube. Very impressive, everybody. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes people um, act like they have T-Rex arms and they're unable to hit the like button. Make sure you hit that like button, share, get more people out there looking at the videos because we're going to be going through every video that he does refuting all of his arguments another one another one that i'll be looking at probably this weekend will be on the eucharist where fib and farouk really just butchers eucharistic theology just tortures it out of out of out of his mind just terrible how he doesn't know a thing about the christian faith but a claim that you hear fib and farouk use very often and by the way, I see people messaging me asking me if Sam will be joining me. The brother Sam will be joining. These are sessions that 99% um, of the time we do together. We call them brothers in arms sessions. We're a team. He will be, but right now he's probably hunting mountain lions. Um, actually, he went for a hike. So, you know, he probably could be hunting mountain lions knowing Sam. He will be here shortly, though. Um, so we're, one thing that we're going through is we're going through all of the arguments that Fib and Farouk has put forth and we're tearing them down to show you that there's nothing good. There's no good material that he has. He claims to have read the Bible from beginning to end, but he doesn't know basic teaching of the Bible. When you look at, and that is just bad luck. My, 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 my Diet Coke, it seems like I left it in the freezer too long and it has frozen over. What, what, uh, what poor luck that I seem to have this evening. But uh, anyway, <laughs> live shows can get, give me one second. Okay, so I am back. Uh, okay, sorry for that minor glitch. So uh, back to what we were talking about. In John 1, and, and th these are the real fun things about these sessions, because not only do we, re we refute the horrible arguments being put forth by Fib and Prue, um, but we look at the testimony of the earliest followers of the faith. Those that we call the early church fathers, the early apostolic fathers. I know some people have emailed me about some materials for the early fathers. Don't worry. I will get back to you. I'm just really, I've got a lot of stuff that I've been working on, shows, working on a book, uh, preparing for a debate, preparing for shows like this. I promise you, when time allows, I will get back to you with some incredible patristic material on the early church fathers that show the incredible Trinitarian faith that our early fathers held to. The early church fathers, we look at them as well. Why is it important to look at the early fathers? I'm going to tell you why. People like Fib and Farouk, they attack the very foundation of the Bible. They go right to the heart of the Bible. They butcher the text. One example is John 1. In a bit, when we begin going through the Gospel of John, you're going to note and see how there is torture going on. The torture is to the text. Because Fib and Farouk cannot deal with it. He can't deal with the fact that in John 1, it is talking about Christ. So what he then does, he then argues and says, when people go to his stand, where he's giving out free, um, free comic strips, that might as well be a comic strip, the Quran, where he's giving out free, um, free Qurans, he then tells them, Christians, prove to me from the Bible that Christ is God. A classic text that Christians will frequently go to, as you know very well, is John 1. And then he will then use the argument that, well, that's the, that's the word. That's not Christ. In John 1, that's not talking about Christ, despite the fact that we read, and the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Despite the fact that the very text itself 
identifies the Logos as Christ, but we'll break that down more so when Sam comes. Despite the very fact that there's no doubt when you look at John 1 that it is talking about our Lord and Savior. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace, for the law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Christ, Jesus Christ. Everywhere you look through here, we read of the truth of the incarnation. Our Lord and Savior came in the flesh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. How then can somebody like Fib and Farouk, by the way, I'll play the little clip so you can hear. When the brother Sam comes, I'll rewind it. Okay, but, but l listen to me. Here, here's a Bible. Show me where Jesus is God, I'll believe you. Here's a Bible. I've read the whole Bible. I've read, I'm challenging you right now. If you, if you show me one time in the Bible, Jesus is God, I'll believe you. Here's the Bible, show me. Your kids are looking at you and you're not showing me from the Bible. I believe in what? I believe in what? I don't believe in Allah. I don't believe in Allah. How are you going to tell me something I don't believe? I believe in Allah. Al Ilah. You know what that means? You know what Al Ilah means? So, what he's going to go forward and do, and we're going to look at it more in depth right now, he's going to go forward and he's going to begin to butcher the Bible as he always does. Rather, rather than being called Fib and Farouk, we should call him the Bible butcher. He's so terrible, and I got to be clear with you all, pathetic when it comes to the Bible. He's a disgrace. He takes advantage of old men that don't know the faith well, or young teenagers, and then he'll label the videos as if he destroyed some mega theologian. When truth be told, if he were to ever debate anybody with even a surface level knowledge of the Christian faith, he would be annihilated. Brother, how you doing? Looking good, brother. I think you are on mute, brother. Let me, um, there, I unmuted you there. You hurt my feelings. You muted me. No, I didn't mute you, brother. What I, what I went ahead and I did was uh, a really good option. Instead of, you know how sometimes people come in and they're really loud? So yeah. now there's an option that Zoom has to where automatically when they come in, they'll be auto-muted. Oh, no, yeah, I'm just playing with you, brother. But good to see you, brother. Glory to Jesus Christ. I, I Amen. Trust you guys already began in prayer and asked the Lord Jesus to bless us, huh? We sure did, brother. Kateri was very kind and praying for all of us. And we, um, uh, last I checked, I think we had a pretty decent audience looking. And you have about 250 on your YouTube and increasing. In Jesus there we go. Thank the good Lord. Yeah, brother. So what, what I was looking at was, uh, as you know, um, the butchering of, uh, of uh, Fib and Farouk, which is just really disgraceful how, um, how he wrenches John 1 out of context and he does it without it without shame, without any shame, brother. Of course, we know. So wherever you want to begin, I'll follow by the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord as he fills us with the Spirit. So, Amen, brother. Let me let me put the clip. I'll play the clip. Yep. My first time here. There's no name, priest, and prophet. Okay, but I, I want people to be aware of one thing, because they don't know. Before we begin these, I never tell Sam, we're going to look at this or that video. Is it or is it not true, brother? This is the first time you're looking at this clip. Yes, I don't know what we're going to hear. Yep. But l listen to me. Here. Here's a Bible. Show me where Jesus is God, I'll believe you. Here's a Bible. I've read the whole Bible. I've read. I'm challenging you right now. If you, if you show me one time in the Bible, Jesus is God, I'll believe you. Here's the Bible. Show me. Your kids are looking at you, and you're not showing me from the Bible. I believe in what? I believe in what? I don't believe in a lot. I don't believe in Allah. How are you going to tell me something I don't believe? I believe in Allah. Al Ilah. You know what that means? You know what Al Ilah means? Jesus Ilah. Show me in the Bible. Show me. Here, John. I have John's right here. 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 Okay, here. Come, come, come. Show me. Show me. Here's John. Okay. Here's John. Go ahead. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Uh -huh. And the word was God. Where's Jesus? Jesus <laughs> Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? The word. Not Jesus. Show me Jesus. 
It's right here. <laughs> you can't show me Jesus is God in the whole Bible. Who, who now, brother, I don't know if you've noted, noticed, I was going through a few videos of his, and apparently yeah. maybe about, I counted maybe three or four, where he denies that Christ is the word over and over and over, and then yeah. thumps his chest as if he's pointed to pr proven a point. So he does, huh? Yep. This is, this is probably the fourth video where he denies Christ is the word of John 1. So what, uh, since you watch this guy, I don't, uh, I really don't, because I think he's just, he's pathetic. He's pathetically yep. bad. But since you watched him, what does he say about the word? Does he make a specific argument? Then who is the word? He never, ever identifies exactly who the word is. Rather, he always says the word cannot be Christ, because in the context, it never identifies Christ as being the word. He okay. shows a complete I, I got to be honest, brother, a complete pathetic inability to deal with the Bible. Well, <clears throat> that's fine. Now, his now I want everyone to hear his specific challenge. Uh, can you repeat it one more time so that we don't misrepresent him so people understand what he's not asking? So let's hear him one more time what his challenge yeah. was. His challenge was, and I want people to realize this, if they go to his channel and they put Christ, God, multiple videos come out, the challenge is the same in all of them. Show me anywhere in the bible where it shows jesus christ as god okay good he, he says that in all of those videos and you know what brother it's like he's acting from a script for the cameras yeah. repeating no, the reason, all the time <clears throat> the reason why i want people to hear what he said because he didn't say show me where jesus says i am god that's why Correct. i want to make sure they didn't mishear him now we do have a tendency at times we don't really focus as much as we should. I'm not saying we all do that all the time, but there are times in which like if I'm writing something, I'll play something in the background and I'm hearing it, but not giving it my full attention. So I want to make sure the people here heard what he told the man to do. Show me in the Bible where Jesus is God. In fact, play that if you can, part. That Amen, brother. Time. I'm going to play it so that we do not get accused of misrepresenting him. I'm challenging right now. If you if you show me one time in the Bible, Jesus is God, I'll believe you. Here's the Bible, show me. Your kids are looking at you and you're not showing me from the Bible. I believe in what? I believe in what? I don't believe in Allah. I don't believe in Allah. How are you going to tell me something I don't believe? I believe in Allah. Al Ilah. You know what that means? You know what Al Ilah means? Jesus is the Ilah. Show me in the Bible. Show me. Here, John. John's right here. 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 Okay, here. Come, 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 come. Show me. Show me. Here's John. Okay. Here's John. Go ahead. In the beginning was uh -huh. the Word, and the Word was with God, uh -huh. and the Word was God. Where's Jesus? <laughs> Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? The Word, not Jesus. Show me Jesus. It's right here. <laughs> you can't show me Jesus is God in the whole Bible. Okay, did you hear that? You heard yeah. those words. That's what I just want to make sure people heard him. He's not asking, show us where Jesus said he's God. Show us in the Bible where Jesus is God. Yep. Now, the way he formulated the question, because again, he's not very intelligent. And I know it may come off as sounding being rude, but no, I'm being honest. Uh, one thing you guys know me know about me, <clears throat> I, I tend not to be too politically correct. And I, I hope I don't unnecessarily offend people. But if it happens, may the Lord have mercy on all of us because we have enough people that are sweet and loving. And I'm the opposite extreme because we balance each other out. So you need people like William, who's a lion, but he's a teddy bear. But then you need mean <laughs> jerks like me. But anyway, we balance each other out for the glory of Jesus. We do. Now, the way he formulated the question, show me where Jesus is God in the Bible. That can mean show you where Jesus is is described in such a way that would only make sense if he's God. Things are said about Jesus, characteristics are ascribed to Jesus, functions are ascribed to Jesus that can only be true of God. Or it can mean, show me where the word God is attributed to Jesus. You see, because he's not that intelligent, he doesn't know how to formulate his objection. The way he formulated it, and again, we trust the Holy Spirit to illuminate us and fill us, to glorify Jesus Christ, love Jesus, obey Jesus, not just pay lip service, and know the scriptures to proclaim them for the glory of Christ in Jesus' name. So 
we're trusting in the spirit. I really need the Holy Spirit. Okay. His wording can mean, show me where the Bible calls Jesus God, G-O-D, or show me where the Bible describes Jesus as being God. So we're going to meet both challenges. I'll come back to John 1. I'll do that. But first, it's also important to know what version of the Bible he's reading. My assumption is... King James. I don't know. King James, good. All right. Yep. That's what I looked that up as well, brother. I, I made sure to watch the whole thing. And he also makes the claim that King James, and I know you're going to laugh, corrupted mm -hmm. the Bible. Okay, good. But that's what he uses, right? Yep. Because one thing I want to teach everyone here, always use the Bible version that your interlocutor is using. If he's using King James, you use King James. If he's yep. using... NIV, you use NIV. Do not make an issue out of the Bible translation because all major English translations that are done by committees, not by individual, even in cases where you have an individual doing it, with the exception of heretics like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they are translating up to 93 to 98% of the same Greek and Hebrew texts. The manuscript tradition is so vast so and so uniform in agreement this is why you can pick up any bible you get the same theology that's a testimony to god's faithfulness and goodness in providentially preserving his word so that we know what we read today is what god had the original authors write down by inspiration and god made sure to preserve those words through the extent manuscript stream making it humanly impossible for any group to monopolize the manuscripts and corrupt them to their liking. Glory to the triune God for his goodness and faithfulness in preserving his word as a certain voice for his bride, the church. Okay, since Amen. he goes with the King James, let me show you where does the King James <clears throat> attribute the word God to Jesus? God to Jesus. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 9, verse 5. There we go. And so I'm going to show you where the word God is applied to Jesus. And then I'm going to show you where Jesus is said to be God because he does things, says things, certain titles ascribed to him that can only be ascribed and said of the true God. And I'll show you from the Quran that the Quran agrees. Yep. Amen. Who's of the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God, blessed forever. Amen. So who, who is Jesus? God, blessed forever. Okay, that's one. Now let's go to Acts yep. 20, 28. There we go. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you, hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. God has blood? Sounds well, to me like that must be talking about Christ. Of course, because Jesus is the God man. Now notice the hypostatic union. One eternal divine person who because he took on the nature of man is also truly human and has a physical body. And as a man, he shed his human blood to purchase his church. God Purchase the church by his own blood. This is the two-natured person. One person, two natures. The eternal divine person. He's not a human person. He's an eternal divine person that took on the being of humanity. Right? So anyway, that's one. That's another. All right. Let's go to John 20, 28. Here we go. And we'll come back to John 1 and show that is Jesus. But right now, I just want to... Meet him at his own level, which, of course, he's going to say the Bible's corrupt. That's okay, but you asked for it. Okay, well, John 20, 28. Even if he does try to say that, brother, he's holding the Bible up and demanding people show him from, from that, that Bible. Bible. Okay. And we're doing that. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. There's no way you can tap dance around the grammar. Now, if he wants to go to the original languages, he'll get buried because the Greek is explicit. But... Yep. Even here, said unto him. These words are said unto him, my Lord and my God. Now, as far as the Hebrew Bible is concerned, an Israelite, a monotheistic Jew, cannot have any other Lord and God besides Yahweh. 
before I show you that, just to further reinforce that Thomas is saying these words to Jesus, right? I want you to see the parallel. Let's go to John 20, 27. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Now I want you to see the parallel. It says, then saith he to Thomas. No one's going to deny that Jesus said these things to Thomas. Then it says, and Thomas answered unto him, my Lord, my God. Then in 29, J Jesus saith unto him. You see? Just like Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas said to Jesus. Jesus is speaking to Thomas. Thomas is speaking to Jesus. And what does he say to Jesus? You, Jesus, are my Lord and my God. You can't get around it grammatically. But as far as the Hebrew Bible is concerned, a monotheistic Jew, an Israelite, can only have one Lord and God, namely Yahweh. Let me show you a parallel to this passage that when we compare the Greek is astonishing. So I will look at the Greek with William's help for your benefit, not for him. I'm just using his own Bible, Amen. King James Version. Go to Psalm 35, 23 in the King James. Notice what Thomas said to Jesus, said to him, Ipin, we're now we're butchering the Greek, we're, we're pronouncing it the Rasmin way. Ipin auto, him, singular, said to him, my Lord and my God. Now, Psalm 35, 23, and then we'll read 24 as well. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my Lord and my God. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. So did you catch it? Now in 23, because our brother had John 20, 28 in his mind, he read it in reverse order. It's my God and my Lord. Now it's my okay, bad. but no, I'm glad that you happened. That, you, brother. Know why? you caught that, yep. Yeah, no, but I'm glad that happened. You know why? Because the very fact that you read it the same way shows that for an Israelite, saying my Lord and my God is the same as saying my God and my Lord, and you can only say that about Yahweh. You actually made my point. And they would and, and they would have understood what was happening there in the text. Yep. Now here's what's beautiful. The psalmist is saying it about Yahweh, because in 24, notice the word Lord, it's all capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. For those of you who do not read the Hebrew, like me, I'm a student of Hebrew scholars, I read English, but thank God for modern resources where we can at least access the Hebrew and it's accessible. Now, when you see the word Lord, all capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the translators are indicating to you that in the Hebrew, it is the divine name, Yahweh, yod He wow He yod He vav He. In other words, he's saying this to Jehovah, his God. So who is his God? Jehovah. Who is his God and Lord? Jehovah. A true monotheistic Jew can only say to Jehovah that Jehovah is my God and my Lord. Now let's show, let me show you the Greek. The Greek of Psalm 35, 23 is Psalm 34, 23. Can you show them Psalm 34, 23 in your Greek? Yep. Psalm, let's see. 34, 23, right? Yeah, th because in, in, the, in the Greek, it's uh, the numbering is different. What's 35 in the Hebrew is 34 in the, in the Greek. Here it is. Here it is. Mu ha theos, mu kai ha gurias. There we go. Right here, brother. Yep. So you see, he just brought up the Greek for you. And I'm, remember, there's like a 20-second delay. I'm waiting for it to show up on YouTube. Yeah. In fact, you something what, here. what yeah. I'm going to do is let me, this will Watch work here. really well. Look at that. I am going to copy paste it here and it will be, there we and, go. Can they see it? Is it large enough for them to see? It, it is very large. Yep. It's large enough for them to see. So okay. we've got it real big. Here we go. Okay. Ha now. Theos. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Now notice, ha theosmu kai ha kuriasmu. Ha theosmu kai ha kuriasmu. The God of me and the Lord of me. You see, okay, now, just for you guys, maybe not able to read the Greek letters. If I were to transliterate that, it's O. Now, some, that little sigma on top indicates a breathing sound. So it's H O T H, the theta, E O S M O U K I K A I. H O 
Q-U-R-I-O-S-M-O-U. So pay attention. Ha theosmu literally is the God of me. Mu means of me. The God of me, Kai means and. The God of me and ha kurias, the Lord mu of me. The God of me and the Lord of me. That's the Greek. The God of me and the Lord of me. Now let's look at the Greek of John 20, 28. This is, uh, I've got to tell you, brother, this is mind blowing. I hadn't, I had not looked at the Greek of Psalm 35 before, Psalm 34. Here we go to the Greek, and I remember, I know it off the top of my head. This is, uh, this is amazing. Here we go. Here's the Greek of John 20, 28. And I'm going to make it big enough so that we can look at them together. Yep. Why? Look at that. There we go, brother. Look now, at this. Did you guys see now the Greek of John 20, 28? Watch this. The Greek of John 20, 28. What does Tomas say to him? He's going to put it up for you. There it is. Ha kurias mu kai ha theos mu. Do you see? It's identical. The only thing is the order is reversed. In the Greek of John, instead of it's ha theos mu kai ha kurias mu, it's ha kurias mu kai ha theos mu. It's the same Greek structure. The difference is that the words are reversed. In some, it's the God of me and the Lord of me. But in John, it's the Lord of me and the God of me. You catch it? It's the same Greek structure. And it says the same thing. So Thomas is saying to Jesus what the psalmist said to Jehovah. Now Thomas is a monotheistic Jew. And he cannot say of a creature that this creature, especially a Jewish man, is the Lord of me and the God of me. So he said to Jesus, notice, Ipen auto, singular, you, Jesus, are the Lord of me and the God of me. The Lord, the God of me. Okay? So where in his Bible is Jesus said to be God? Well, we just gave you, we gave you Romans 9, 5, Acts 20, 28, and we also gave you John 20, 28. Now, since he's going with the King James Version, let me give you another one. Remember, Use the Bible that your opponent is using. If it's King James, stick with the King James. They like to play Bible ping pong. They will yep. change translations on you when a translation ends up backfiring against them. Right? First Timothy 3.16. Watch this. First Timothy 3.16, the King James. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest. In the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. God was manifest in the flesh. So who appeared in the flesh? Not some creature, but God. There you go. So where does the Bible say Jesus is God? Well, here, if you mean the word theos, the final one, Hebrews 1 verses 8 to 9, but we're going to unpack that one. Go to Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 9. But under the sun, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, be, here in verse 8, God the Father is speaking to the Son. And he addresses the Son and glorifies the Son and praises the Son as the God who reigns forever. Now, you don't see it in your English, but actually in the Greek, it's ha theos, thy throne, the God. So God the Father glorifies, praises, magnifies his Son and calls his son Ha Theos, the God, which in Arabic is El Ilah. In Arabic, if I render Ha Theos in Arabic, it would be El Ilah. And so when the that Christian told him, Jesus is Ilah, the Arabic word for deity, go show me. Well, right there, he is Ha Theos in Arabic, El Ilah. But here's where it's going to get astonishing. Xavier, if I have to explain it again, you know you're getting blocked. Didn't I tell you? If he's using the King James Version, 
you use that version to prove your case. And the King yep. James in 1 Timothy 3.16 is God. If I mm -hmm. have to repeat myself again, Xavier, that means you're not listening. And then I'm going to have to send you on your merry way. Yep. You got to pay attention. Now, Hebrews 1.8. Notice it's ha theos. So God the Father glorifies, magnifies, praises his son as ha theos, the God, not simply as a God. Now, here's what's interesting. Those of you who speak Arabic, Arabic speakers who read Arabic, you know how the Arabic of Hebrews 1.8 is translated? It has God saying to Jesus in Arabic, your throne, Ya Allah. Ya Allah. He's called Allah in the Arabic Bible. So Jesus is Allah. But now it gets a little worse for our friend. Okay. It gets a little worse for our friend. Now go back. I want you to read Hebrews 1, 8 to 9 again to see so that no one denies that it's the Father speaking to the Son and about the Son. Amen. But to, unto the Son, unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So make sure he or anyone else sees it's the father talking to the son about the son. The subject, object do not change. The subject is the son. The father speaking to the son about the son. Because then in verse 10, the conversation continues and the father goes on to say to the son and about the son. Notice what the father says about the son and to the son. In verses 10 to 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they, shall, they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shall thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Okay, so here God, notice, guys, be blown away. If God the Father Almighty glorifies, praises, magnifies Jesus as the eternal, eternally reigning God and as the Lord who created the heavens and the earth, who remains unchangeable, unlike creation, that he rolls up and changes. This is what the Father thinks of the Son and says to the Son. He says to the Son, you are the Lord who at the beginning. This is an echo of the creation account of Genesis. God the Father said that at the beginning, meaning Genesis in the beginning, it was you, my son. You were that very Lord who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. You are that very Lord who laid the foundations of the earth and made the heavens by your own hands. You are that Lord that rolls them up because you oversee and sustain creation. And unlike creation, you are unchangeable. That's who you are, my son. The unchangeable eternal creator, sustainer of all creation, the very Lord of heaven and earth, and the eternally reigning God. So you mean to tell me, brother, from the very Bible that he's waving at people to show him that Christ is God from, that yep. we can show him clearly? Yep. And then he's going to tell you, well, these passages are corrupt. We don't know who wrote Paul. But wait, that wasn't your challenge. You just said show you from the Bible. So if you then say my Bible's corrupt, you prove my point. My Bible does, does teach the Trinity and Jesus is God Almighty, and you can't refute it, so now you have to attack its integrity. So now that's the first way of answering his objection. Because remember I said there are two ways to understand his objection, his challenge. Show me where Jesus is said to be God, meaning where the word God is ascribed to him, or show me where Jesus is identified as being God by way of <clears throat> the New Testament writers Attributing to Jesus the very names that belong to God alone, the very characteristics, attributes that only God possesses, and functions that only God can perform. So we answered the first way that you can understand a challenge. Let's answer it the second way. Where does the Bible attribute to Jesus titles, names, characteristics, attributes, and functions that only belong to God? which would therefore prove that Jesus is being described as God. Well, let me show you. 
Let's first look at what the Quran says. If you don't mind, brother, open up chapter 57, verse 3 of the Quran. You got it, brother. Let me briefly hit that button there so I can, because it, it gets uh, locked up on the top. Okay. And do it. make sure we answer Moses and Abraham objection, because I'm excited to show there were Christians. Oh, yeah, we definitely will, brother. There we go. And by the way, uh, I've got that other, I've got it open right over here. So, yeah, we'll definitely get to that. Okay, we are here. We got the Quran. Uh, where was it in the Quran? Chapter brother? 57, verse 3. You can use any translation if you want. Uh, let me go with Pickthol. Here we go. Here we go. He is the first and the last, and the outward and the inward, and he is knower of all things. Okay, notice. Allah is said to be the first and the last, and he's the knower of all things. He would agree with you as a Muslim. Only Allah is the first and last, and only Allah is the knower of all things. Remember that. He will agree with you. Only Allah is the first and last, and only Allah is the knower of all things. Okay, good. Go to Revelation 1, 17, brother. It's going to be 17, 18, but don't read 18. Just go to Revelation 1 and start with 17 first. Here we go. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. So what I do is when I'm dialing with a Muslim or a Jehovah Witness, I will show them if I'm dealing with a Muslim, chapter 57, verse 3. And I say to them, your Quran says only Allah is the first last. They go, yeah. Then I have them read Revelation 117. And when they read it, when I saw him, I fell his feet as dead. And he placed his right hand upon me and said, do not be afraid. I'm the first last. Then I asked them, who is that? Immediately, without thinking, they say Allah. That's Allah. I go, okay. Now read verse 18. Because they'll admit first last is the title of Allah. Okay, now read verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive evermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So when did your Allah die? Oh, uh, but, 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 but God, God could never die, they'll say. But hold on. Whoever this is, claimed to be the first last, which the Quran agrees, is a name that belongs only the, to the true God. So here, the true God is saying, I died and I came to life forevermore. So you caught it? Jesus is claiming to be God, who is man, and as man who died, but then ceased to exist, and then was raised to immortal life. So Jesus just claimed one of the very names that even the Quran says is true of God alone. See it? I'm the first last. I am he that liveth. I was dead, but behold, I live forevermore. Now, it also says Allah is the knower of all things. Allah is the knower of all things. John 21, 17. Yeah. And, and if you guys want me to show you the parallel in the Old Testament where God is said to be the first last, I will. Amen. He saith unto him the third time. Hold on, uh, brother. You got this uh, dog named Birdo. He's saying, am I going to take up all the time or talk or let you talk? Do you know this clown? That's I have to, I have no idea who that is, brother. Send him send him out of here, brother. I have no idea who that clown is. So basically, he's a satanic rabid dog who's barking to cause distraction. No idea who that is, brother. But um, for 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 people that may be wondering, Sam and I we do these sessions together. Uh, mm -hmm. In case people don't realize, a lot of the times Sam does the majority of the Bible. I supplement with the fathers. Uh, I don't know what the issue is, but I have yeah. no idea who Berto is. Seems to me maybe he's. You no, know, he's, he's the Mohammedans have been going apes because we've been destroying yep. Uthman and his God and his Prophet, and they can't handle it. You should see how they manifest with different names and and fake accounts and just start slandering and blaspheming in the comment section. Brother, that they were doing it in their heads, and they know we that weren't we even live. Like yep, they were attacking. Here in this session, before we went even even went live, they were already attacking. But you know what it is, brother? They're furious. They're Amen. feeling. And Glory to Jesus, brother. That means we are accomplishing the will of God and that we are making an impact because their world is being destroyed before their eyes and they can't do anything about it because Muhammad is a false prophet, Allah is a false God, and Jesus has brought Muhammad under his feet. The only thing they can do is repent and fall in love with Jesus who died for them. And that's our hope. And I, I hate to break it to them, brother, but we're just getting started. It's not going to stop for them anytime soon. 
hopefully they'll be so uncomfortable and angry that they'll run to the feet of Jesus and join us and be our brothers and sisters in Christ, because that's what we want. Amen. Amen, brother. hundred percent. And you know, the, the real sad thing is that the, those kind of demonic distractions take from the fact that we're trying to help the brethren, the sisters out so they can see we were talking about an old Testament parallel and then the hateful claws come out, brother. Yeah, that's fine. I just want Alberta to know that, uh, his tricks, his satanic tricks from his father, the devil won't work. Now, with that Amen. said, guys, don't forget the Quran said, Allah is the first, last, and the knower of all things. John 21, 17. He says unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Okay, now, according to the Quran, only Allah is the knower of all things. But Peter, a Jew, says to this risen Jew, because this is after the resurrected resurrection of our Lord, three weeks later, he says to this risen Jew who's standing before him in his glorified physical body, not only is he Lord, Rab, which in Islam, Rab can only be attributed to God, Rab, but he is the Lord who knows all things, already knows whether Peter loves him or not, because you can't hide anything from this Lord. He already knows your heart, right? Amen. Okay, now, with that said, did Jesus know all things before the resurrection? Well, let's go to John 16. Let's read. Just break it down in two sections. It's John 16, 25 to 31, but first read John 16, 25 to 28, and pause right after 25. Here you go. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. So notice what Jesus says. I'm not speaking figuratively, parabolically. I'm now speaking plainly. So you get it finally. Okay, now as Jesus speaks plainly, not parabolic, parabolic, parabolically or figuratively, as the Lord Jesus loosens our tongue, what does he plainly say about himself? Now read 26 and 28. At that day, you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you, that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came, from, uh, that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and I'm coming to the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Okay, now notice the response of the apostles. This is before the resurrection. Notice what they say in 29 and 30. Pay attention, guys. His disciples said to him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee? By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. So again, we now see you're speaking plainly, not figuratively, and we finally get it. You know everything and don't need to be questioned and tested to see if you know what you're talking about. Because now we believe you know everything and you came from God the Father. And did Jesus rebuke them for saying he knows everything? Notice 31. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Wow. So if Jesus is a finite Jew, a creature who's not God in the flesh, he should have said, shut up, shame on you. How dare you say I know everything and I don't need to be tested. Only God knows all things, stupid. Oh, you finally believe? It finally dawned on you, huh? That I am the omniscient Lord, the almighty son of God, who came from the Father because I was with him in heaven and I came to become flesh to save you and to glorify in my presence. Finally get it? Oh, okay. So, but wait, according to the Quran, Allah is the first last and the knower of all things. Now, for those of you who want to kill two birds, one stone, how can you use these passages for the Joe's witnesses? Because here we're dealing with him, but I'm going to give you dessert with our five course meal by the grace of God. Amen. Not only is this a way that you use to silence this Muslim, you can use the same passages to silence the Joe's witnesses, because I want you to know, in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it's going to read the same way. So you don't need to change translations. We're only using the King James for this Muslim, because that's what he uses. But the Jehovah's Witness Bible reads the same way, and in modern English, so it'll be easier for many people to get it. It says the same thing you read here. 
Yep. Jesus is faking, speaking plainly, not figuratively. And the apostles conclude, you know, all things don't need to be questioned. And in John 21, 17, same way in the Jehovah Witness Bible, Lord, you know everything. And in the Jehovah Witness Bible, Jesus says, I'm the first and last who was dead. And behold, I live forevermore. Now, why is that important? Because then you take them to the following passages. You take the Jehovah Witness to the following passages. Go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, brother. Here we go. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Wait, God knows all things. Jesus on earth before and after his resurrection knows all things. And I'm going to show you that in the Old Testament, God is the first and last and Jesus first and last. And you still want to convince me that the Bible doesn't teach Jesus is the God man, the two natured person. Now go to Isaiah 44 verse 6. And it's going to read the same way in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Here we go. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Now go to Isaiah 48, verse 12. Here we go. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I am... Also, I also am the last. Jehovah Witness Bible reads the same way. So then you go to Revelation 1, 17 and 18 and ask them, say, when did Jehovah die? Because it says, I am the first and last, the one who lives and who was dead. In fact, show them also Revelation 2, verse 8. Amen. So go to Revelation 2, verse 8, brother. Here we go. Revelation 2, verse 8. And under the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Wow. So Jesus is the first and last that died and now lives forevermore. And yet the first and last, according to the Old Testament and the Quran, is a title ascribed only to the true God. Okay, so let's continue along this theme. I'll give you a few more examples where Jesus clearly is identified as God, even by Islamic standards, meaning according to the Quran and Islamic tradition, Jesus does things and says things and things are said about him that can only be said of God. Let's go back to the Quran, chapter 22 of the Quran, verses 6 and 7. That is because Allah, he is the truth, and because he quickeneth the dead, and because he is able to do all things, and because the hour will come, there is no doubt thereof, and because Allah will raise those who are in the graves. Did you catch it? Pay attention now. Allah is the truth. Allah is the truth. He quickens whom he wills. He gives life to the dead. And then it says, the hour is coming. You got to pay attention to this. Where Allah will give life to those who are in the graves. He will resurrect the dead out of their graves because he's the one who gives life and he is the truth. And he'll raise the dead from their graves at the hour. Don't forget this. So you get this Ibn Fibbin to admit only Allah is the truth. Only Allah gives life to the dead at the, at the hour. And only Allah will raise the dead out of their graves at the hour. He's going to have to say yes because the Quran says it. Now go to John 14 verse 6. Here we go. Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Wait, who is the truth? Jesus. Who's the life? Amen. Jesus. al haq and al hay al hayat Okay. You challenge the Muslims like this man. Show me a single verse in the Bible or in your Quran where someone other than God Almighty says he is the truth and the life. And they can't do that. So why is Jesus saying he is the truth when your Quran says the truth is the name of your God and the life when only God is the life? But it's going to get worse for our friend. Remember what 22 verses 6 to 7 said. Allah gives life, quickens the dead, and the hour is coming where Allah will give life to those in the graves, bring them out of their graves. Now watch what Jesus says. Go to John 5, 21, brother. Amen. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Wow. So Jesus is not the Father. He's the Son. 
but he's almighty like the father because he can do what the father does. And the things the father does are things that only God can do. Just like the father raises the dead and gives them life, so too the son gives life to whom he wills. But now read, same chapter, John 5, 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Okay, now, that, that's got to be a typo. You just read in chapter 22, verse 7 of the Quran, the hour is coming, have no doubt, where Allah will raise the dead from their graves. And yet here Jesus, the Son speaking, in his Bible, the King James, he says, the hour is coming, and it is now come, where the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Now read 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Okay, in John 5, 28 says, those who are in their graves will come out at the hour when they hear his voice. Whose voice? Read 25, so that no one misses it. Whose voice? Verily, verily, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. How can Jesus claim the very functions that the Quran says only Allah is capable of doing? But again, let's make it worse for our, our pagan stone-kissing friend. Go to John 6, if you can, brother. Read Amen. 37 to 40. John 6, 37 to 40. Here we go. All that the Father has given me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Well, who's going to resurrect believers immortal at the last day? The Son. You got it. I will raise them up at the last day, the day of yep. resurrection. Now keep reading. Amen. All the way to 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Challenge him to show you from the Quran or the Old Testament someone other than God resurrecting believers to immortal life at the last day. And you won't find it. And yet the Son, distinct from the Father, does so. And this is Jesus speaking. Now read 41 to 44. 41 to 44, same chapter. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father, which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Could it be any wow. clearer that the Jesus of the Bible, who's the true Jesus of history, because the Bible's accurate history, inspired, <clears throat> sacred history, preserved, is claiming to be God Almighty in the flesh, though he's not the Father, even from the Muslim standard. Now, I can multiply example after example, but I think this should suffice because oh, yeah. we won't unpack John 1 if you guys want to, because he Amen. said John 1 is not about Jesus, about the Word, right? He has made that claim multiple times, brother, and I think just on the claim of him waving his Bible and saying, show me where Christ is God, I think we have buried that objection okay yeah that objection we buried so if you're interested up to you brother however you want to oh yeah it. definitely brother we can, interested, we, we can we can now unpack yep unpack john one show that the word is jesus in his preeminent existence who became flesh the most obvious the most obvious proof is john 1 14 the most obvious yep. to show them john 1 14 but By the way, how, how's uh, how's the youtube still we still got trolls brother or no, no, brother. You got 380 watching you. Great. People, uh, Great. no, no more trolls. This is our numbers for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen, brother. Amen. So the, um, just want the audience, people maybe uh, barely tuning in to realize what we're talking about. The claims of uh, Fib and Farouk get lost. that in, in, in John 1, you're able to hear me, right? Yes, go ahead. Okay, that in John 1, the claim is 
that when we read in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was God, that that word is not Christ is the claim. And we're going to rip that argument to shreds. Yep. Okay. Now John 1 14, the most obvious. Here we go. The most obvious. John 1 14. And the word, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Did you catch it? Okay. Right there. The word became Jesus of Nazareth. To say this is not Jesus in his preeminent existence, you're being satanically deceptive. But let me just give you irrefutable contextual proof that that word is Jesus before he became flesh so that the Gospel of John is the inspired record of the history of the word in flesh. John's Gospel is an accurate biography of the historical Jesus who is the eternal word that became a flesh and blood human being. Let me prove it to you. Okay, we're going to take it step by step. Everything said about the word in the prologue is said about Jesus in the narrative. So let's let me show you now. And Lord willing, remind me, brother, before I leave, to give you an article where I had to write an article because I got sick of the Unitarians saying yep. it's not Jesus. So I have an article where I show whatever is said of the word is said about Jesus in the narrative, the historical Jesus. He's described with the same characteristics that the word is described with in the prologue. Because the word is Jesus before he became flesh. Jesus is the word after he became flesh. Right? Amen, brother. Definitely. Okay, now let me let me show it. Now, when it says John 1, 1 and 2, it says, and the word was with God. The word was with God. Now, we're going to have to do look into the Greek a little bit. You don't need to be a Greek scholar. I want you to see what the phrase with God is. It's pros tan theon, if you can show them the Greek. Amen, brother. Here we go. And I'm going to put it. I'm going to make it big for them to be able to see like last time. Here we go. Okay, make it bold. And there we go. Everybody should be able to see very clearly there. In the beginning was the word, and the word was, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Here we go. Okay. Now, the with God, the part prostantheon, I want you to pay attention. Prostantheon. I'm going to show you. That phrase that's used of the word is used of Jesus in the narrative. Where? Let's go to John 16, 27, 28 again. And let's read it because I'm going to let you show them the Greek. John 16, 27, 28. Here we go. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am, and am come into the world again. I leave... Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Okay. You see where it says go to the Father, guys? Go to the Father is pros tan patera. Same preposition, pros. I pros tan patera. Like the word was pros with tan theon the God. Jesus will now pros tan patera. Go back to the Father. So he was with the Father, came into the world, and he's going back to the Father. Do you see the phrase? You can highlight that for them. Pros tan patera. Yep. In fact, let me uh, let me pull up the Greek of John 16 as well, brother. 28. So they can see it's the same phrasing. The difference is it uses Father instead of God. But I'm going to show you where God is used. Here we go. It is right here. And I am going to highlight it red for them to see that as well look at this right here everyone see it the word cross ton patera there it is now how does that connect with jesus just like the word was with pros god tantheon jesus is going back to be with pros the father ton patera but now let me show you where this phrasing is used identically word for word for the historical jesus now let's go to John 13, verse 3. Here we go. Now let Jesus. me know in the comments section, guys, you're making the connection with the Greek, and I'm not confusing you. Amen. Please. 
Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Now, guess what the word to God is again? It's pros tan theon. It's the exact same Greek phrase. The word pros tan theon. With God, Jesus is going pros tan theon, going to be with God. So he is the word that was with God, who went to the world and is going back to be with God again. Everyone see that what is said of the word is said of the historical Jesus because the word is Jesus in flesh. It's the same person. Look at that, brother. I have made it large for John 13, 3 as well. That is mind-blowing. And there it is in the red. Pros ton theon. Same phrase, right? Exact same phrase. So that means, how are you going to say that the word who was with God didn't become jesus in the flesh because the same thing said of the word he was with god then into the world to become flesh is now going to be with god it's just, in other words to say that jesus is not that word you are either blind mentally challenged or truly of the devil to butcher the scripture or all this of way, the right? above all okay of the above, now i'd say let's make other connections that what said of the word is said of jesus let's go to john 1 4 John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now pay attention. Two things about the word. In the word was life, and that life is what illuminates man. And that life was the light of man. So the word illuminates man to bring them out of their darkness into life. In him was life, and that life was the light of man. And notice again that the word that's coming to the world is also described as a true light. Read John 1. 8 to 9. And pay attention to 9. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was a true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Okay, so the true light is the word that comes into the world to lighten every man, to enlighten every man. So notice, the word is the true light. In the word was life, and that word is the light of all men. Let's see what Jesus says about himself. Go to John 5, 26. Here we go. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. So just like the Word had life in himself, the Son has life in himself. Hmm, coincidence? No, because Jesus is the Word who became flesh. Amen. Now go to John 8, 12. Here we go. John 8, 12. Then spoke Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Okay, I'm confused. In John 1, 4 and 1, 9, we're told the word has life in itself. And the word is the true light that lightens every man and gives light to the world. But Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and whoever believes in me will have that light in himself. John 9, verses 4 and 5. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So just like the true light came into the world, Jesus says, I'm in the world to be the light. To bring you out of your darkness. Amen. But I thought the word is in Jesus. So then why is Jesus claiming to be and ascribing to himself the same qualities that John ascribed to the word? I thought the word is not Jesus. Okay, well, more connections. Now let's go to John 1. We're going to read 6 to 8. We're going to read 8 again. But John 1, 6 to 8. Here we go. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Okay, so John the Baptist was sent to bear witness to the light. Now, don't forget this. This is important. John the Baptist was sent to bear witness that the light is coming to the world, believe in the light. Now we got a problem, though, because according to Ibn Fibbin, 
The word who's the light is not Jesus. But now read John 1, brother, if you can. Read for us. Read from verse 23 all the way to 28. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah, for which they were sent, for, for, and they which were sent were the Pharisees. And they asked him and said to him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Okay, now pay attention. John says, I'm bearing witness of the Lord that Isaiah said would come, and I'm not good enough to stoop down and untie his sandal straps because he exists before me and he is greater rank than me. Okay, but remember what John 1, 6 to 8 said. John came to bear witness to the light, the true light that was coming in the world and telling people to leave in that light. But John just said that he came to bear witness to an individual, not an abstraction. Who is that individual? Now read John 1, 29, all the way to 34. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come, baptizing with water. And John bare records, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Brother, I'm really confused. Can you help me understand what you just read? Because in John 1, 6 yep. to 8, we're told, John the Baptist was sent to bear witness to the word who is the light, the true light that comes into the world. And according to Ibn Fibbin, that word, that light is not Jesus. But here from John's own mouth, we are told he was sent to bear witness to Jesus. How can he bear witness to Jesus if he was sent to bear witness to the word who is the light that was coming into the world and the world, the word is not Jesus, according to Ibn Fibbin? According to Ibn Fibbin, if he had his way, he would toss verse 34 and verse 14 and uh, the rest of the Bible out, brother, it's honestly, it's disgraceful and embarrassing. Okay, and just in case we didn't get it, read 35 and 36 of John 1. John 1, 35, 36. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. I'm very confused because John was supposed to bear witness to the true light, who is the word and bring people to believe in that light. But here, he's bearing witness to Jesus and causing people to believe in Jesus, which according to Ibn Fibbin, Jesus is not that word who's the true light. I've right? got to be quite honest with you, brother. It, it, what kind of a person tries to rip the clear biblical context out? That is just really pitiful and pathetic and demonic. Okay, now... Before we wrap up John 1 and go to Moses and Abraham, we believe that John, who wrote the gospel, also wrote Revelation. And the early church fathers, with unbroken chain, affirmed yep. that, like Irenaeus. And you're the expert there, and you can confirm Amen. that point. You are correct, brother. Contrary to what some modern scholars would say, that's the ancient faith of the church, right? Amen. Amen. Okay. From the very beginning. Okay, so now let's see what John says about Jesus in Revelation. Let's go to Revelation 19 and read verses 11 to 13. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So 
he, a person, a living, conscious person, is the word of God? That's what he just said, right? Yep. He, oh, yeah. his, who rides a horse, his name is the word of God. So the word of God is a person, not an abstraction. But yep. who is this person that's the word of God? Well, keep reading all the way to 16, brother. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So whoever this male figure is who rides the white horse, who slays the nations with the sword out of his mouth, who's called the word of God, he's also called King of kings, Lord of lords. We'll go to Revelation 17, 14, so we can see who that is. Revelation 17, 14. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So Jesus is the Lamb, and the Lamb is the Lord of Lord and King of Kings, which is why he conquers everyone, because he's almighty. And yet that same Jesus, Revelation 19, is the figure who rides a white horse, whose name is the Word of God. Could it be any clearer that Jesus is the Word of God, and that the Word is a person, an eternal divine person who became a male human being? The flesh and blood Jesus who now exists in his glorified physical body of flesh and bone because he's still truly human and truly God? The contexts are clear as can be, brother. The claims that come from Fib and Farouk that we had to wait for this to be decided upon at the Council of Nicaea are just a joke. Now, brother, just to bless everyone, I sent you a link. Remember, Jesus is said to be Lord of Lords, King of Kings, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Notice what Muhammad said about a person who calls himself king of kings. Read that for us. This is Sahil Bukhari. Sahil Bukhari. I put the link here in Zoom and in, in YouTube. Sahil Bukhari, volume 8, book 73, hadith number 224. Allah's messenger said, The most awful name in Allah's sight on the day of resurrection will be that of a man calling himself Malik al-Amlak, the Which king means? of kings. So wait, Allah hates anyone who calls himself king of kings, meaning that even Muhammad recognized the title king of kings cannot be given to a creature. And yet Jesus revealed to John that he, the lamb, the word of God, is king of kings and lord of lords. Let me give you another one from Sahih Muslim. Okay. Here is Sahih Muslim. I gave you the link, Sahih Muslim. When you pop it up, they'll see it. But let me now put it in YouTube. Let me just get on, man. Oof, hold on. I got to, where am I now? Okay. Now watch this, guys. Sahih Muslim. As he get, pops it up, let me just hold on. I got to. Okay, brother. Read that for them. There's a link for you guys on YouTube. The most wretched person in the sight of Allah on the day of resurrection and the worst person and target of his wrath, what of the person who is called Malik Am Amlak, the mm. king of kings, for there is no king but Allah. Now, this is Sahih Muslim, meaning sound. Book 25, hadith number 5339. 5339. So why does Allah hate when someone calls themselves king of kings? Because there is no king but Allah. But Jesus claimed to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which means that he's claiming to be Allah, the true Allah, not the fake Allah of the Quran. In fact, brother, if you scroll up, what's the chapter name? If you go up, you'll see it right there. The prohibition of the names Malik Am Amlak or Malik Al Muluk, yep, King of King Kings. Of Kings. So you see how this guy basically destroyed himself by trying to pervert the scriptures, because what does God say to those who pervert his word? Go to Proverbs chapter 30 and read verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. See? 
God will shame and humiliate you if you dare pervert a scripture and twist it. And, and he'll he do so shield. by raising up. Amen. Amen, brother. And he'll do it by raising up the people that he has consecrated by the Spirit for the glory of Jesus. And I pray I'm one of them, and I know Amen. William is. So glory to God. Now, the final evidence from John that Jesus is the Word, who is the eternal God, the creator of all things. From John. We also believe John wrote the letters of John. Now, yep. remember how he begins the gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All right. And the Word became flesh. Now, let's go to 1 John chapter 1 and read verses 1 to 3. Malik al-Amlak, not bin Amlak. Malik bin Amlak means king, son of king. Mm. That Verse which one, was... One, Verses 1, one to 3. Read it, brother. One to three, brother. You got it. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Okay, now, here's where I'm confused, because it says, we handled with our physical hands the word of life. You see, guys, verse 1? John is saying, I am one of ma many, one of many witnesses that physically touch the word of life with our hands. Not only that, it says, not only do we physically handle the word of life with our physical hands, we touch the word of life. We saw the life appear, and we bear witness, and we make known to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was manifested to us. We saw the eternal life. The life appeared to us. The word of life appeared. We saw, we heard, and we physically touched the word of life, life, and eternal life. Notice the three descriptions of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the word of life. He is life. He's eternal life. We saw with our eyes, we heard with our ears, we physically touched with our hands the word of life, life, and eternal life. And what eternal life? The one who was with the Father, and we make him known to you. How in the world can this be referring to an abstraction and not an actual living person that became physical and they physically touched and saw? Grammatically and contextually, it is impossible, brother. That's why he goes on to say, because we've made known to you who the word of life is, the life and eternal life, you now can have intimate, loving, personal fellowship with the Father and the Son, because the Son, Jesus Christ, is that word of life, life, eternal life. But to further connect this statement with the prologue, you see where it says, and the eternal life, which was with the Father, with the Father, guess what the Greek is? Pros tan patera. There's that word again. Pros. Pros wow. tan patera. Show that to him if you can, brother. What what uh what verse is it, brother? First John 1, verse 2. Here we go. Oh, yeah, it's right here. So let us look at 1 verse 2. Here it is. Making it big for everybody to look. There we go. Prostan Theon. Well, in 1 John 1 2, it should be Prostan Patera, right? Are you in 1 John 1 2? Ah, I am, I'm, I'm an idiot. I was in John you 1 went in 2. the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 2. 1 John 1 2. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. 1 John 1 2. Okay, 1 John 1 2. Watch here, guys. Here we go. That proves to you it's the same author because even the style of writing is the same. Yep. So my mistake shows you that it is so easy to mistake because the the grammar, the style is so similar. Here we go. Same author, yep. Same author. Pros ton patera. There we go. You see, it's the same phrase, preposition, pros, but here it's father instead of God. So just like the word was with God, the eternal life that was with the father, the word of life, the word, life, eternal life, they're one and the same person. The word, the word of life, the life, eternal life, that was with God, with the Father. 
He's the one that we physically saw, heard, and touched. And he is Jesus Christ, the Son. And to further prove it, that that's Jesus, in the epistle, 1 John, go to chapter 2, verse 1, the very next chapter. My little children, these things, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, notice the phrase, with the Father. That's prostan patera. It's identical to 1 John 1, 2. What more proof do you need that Jesus Christ is the eternal life who was with the Father, came into the world, and is now with the Father again? Same phrase. Pros tan patera. Jesus Christ, our advocate, who is pros tan patera. Show them the Greek, brother. Oh, no. I, I got to admit to you, brother, uh, mind-blowing. Look at that right there. Uh, I've highlighted the Greek, underlined it, bolded it. Pros tan patera right there. That is why, brother, I've got to say, that is why all of the early fathers, you look at the early fathers, all the way to the medieval fathers, until modern times, they recognized this as being the very same author until we arrive at modern day scholarship. That, just, that is really disgraceful, modern day scholarship. But look at the, the, the similarity of the grammar. Incredible, brother. Just like in 1 John 1 2, the eternal life was prostan patera with the Father. And 1 John 2 1, it's Jesus Christ who's prostan patera with the Father. Because the word of life, the eternal life, the life, is one and the same. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who became flesh. Amen. See? That's why we need to go back and rediscover the fathers and pray we become like them in their knowledge, their understanding, their depth, and their holiness, and their love and worship and devotion to Jesus so that we can be counted worthy of that company who put us to shame. The hell with modern scholarship. Modern-day scholarship has become a joke. Yep. All right. Sure now, has, let brother. me explain. For the benefit of the brothers... And, we're, and sisters, when I say brother general, because now we got to be gender inclusive, brothers and sisters. But anyway, for their benefit, let me explain what the three titles mean. Why is he said to be the word of life, eternal life, and life? Well, let me explain contextually. Word of life means Jesus reveals what life is. Do you want to know what life is? Do you want to know how to obtain it? Jesus makes it known. He is the word, meaning the revelation of life. Life means that Jesus is the source of life in a general sense, meaning all biological life, all marine life, all plant life, life in general comes from him. And he is also the source of never-ending, everlasting, immortal life. So John is telling us three things about Jesus. He's the one who reveals what life is. He's the one who gives life to all creation to animals, to plants, to marine life, to humans, to the stars and the sun. He sustains all of them. And he's also the source of eternal life for those who believe, because believers will be preserved by Jesus to enjoy never-ending, immortal, incorruptible, physical existence. That's what it means. Now, the icing on the cake, so we can go to Moses and Abraham, because basically I, I think we've done refuting it, but now let me give you icing on your cake. It says in 1 John 1, 2, the eternal light that was with the Father. If you can show that to them one more time. Yep. For the life was manifest, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Now, one thing you'll find in these books, and some of you already know this who've been following me, you have what you find, you, what you have what scholars call an inclusio or a bookend, inclusio, I-N-C-L-U-S-I-O, I-O, or bookend. What that means is this is a literary feature, a device that you find the New Testament author is using. This feature refers to an author ending his writing, concluding his, his book by reiterating, repeating a point that he made at the start of the book but in a different way. So he ends the book the way he starts it. So notice how John starts the epistle. Jesus is the eternal life with the Father. Our fellowship is with the Father and Son. 1 John 1, 2 to 3. He's now going to end the book by reiterating that point that he began with.
But catch it now. Who's the eternal life? The one who's with the Father. And that's Jesus Christ, his son. Because in 1 John 1, 3 says, our fellowship is with the Father and with Jesus Christ, his son. Now notice how he's going to end this letter. Go to 1 John 5, 20, brother. You got it. 1 John 5, 20. Here it is. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him. And we are in him that is true. Even in his Son, Jesus Christ. That is the true God and eternal life. Okay, now we got a problem, heretics. Because here it says, the eternal life is the true God. If you're the true God, you are the eternal life. If you're the eternal life, you are the true God. In other words, you can't be the eternal life if you're a creature. Only the true God, the true God alone is the eternal life. So if you're the eternal life, you must be the true God. If you're the true God, you must be the eternal life. But wait, in 1 John 1, 2, the eternal life is said to be the son who's with the father. You know what? Uh, you, you know what is so fitting, brother, that you you probably don't know because you didn't see before the show began. We were being attacked by Muslims that were demanding that we show them where Jesus is called true God. No, I before, didn't even know that before Honestly. we even began. And by by the way, I'm bearing witness, and God knows if I'm lying. I didn't know what William was going to show me, and I don't have a prepared speech or a script, and I'm not reading from an article. This is all impromptu by the power of the Holy Spirit who's alive, who's almighty, and who fills us with wisdom to confound Amen. our enemies. Amen. Yep. Now, no just doubt. let me just hammer the point again. It is inescapable that if you're eternal life, you must be the true God. Because you can't be the eternal life and be a creature. Because only the true God, the true God alone is the eternal life. Now we have a problem, you heretics. Because in 1 John 1, 2, the eternal life is said to be with the Father, and that's Jesus. So for Jesus to be the eternal life, he must be the true God. Otherwise, he can't be the eternal life. But he is the eternal life. Therefore, he is the true God. And now we see what it means to be in the Father and in the Son. Because notice it says, the Son of God came to make the true God known to us. And we are in him who is true. Even in his Son, who is the true God into our life. To be in God doesn't mean that God is physically in you because God is not a material being, but as a material substance and that he then fills your insides with that material substance. Like you put water in a cup. When the Bible writers say that we're in God or God is in us, it means God is in relationship with us in union with us. We are in relationship with him in union with him. In other words, we are in fellowship with God and Jesus. That's exactly what John said in 1 John 1, 3. So notice the bookend. He ends the letter by reiterating what he said at the beginning. Yep. Jesus is the eternal life with the Father and the Father's Son. And we have fellowship with the Father and Son. So then he ends it by saying, look, we are in him who is true, the Father. We're also in his Son, who is the true God and eternal life. We are in fellowship, in union, in relationship with the Father and the Son, because together they are the true God and eternal life. Now, the only way I can be in fellowship with the Son and the Son be in fellowship with me and all believers universally, to the same extent that the Father is, is if the Son, like the Father, is omnipresent, omniscient. And this is exactly what John says in the Gospel. If you can, let's finish it off with John 14, 23. Amen. A lot of meat in this session. Glory to Jesus. A lot. Amen, brother. John 14, 23. Here it is. Jesus answered and said to them, and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. There you go. That's what it means to be in the Father and the Son, in fellowship with the Father and the Son. Both the Father and the Son have sworn. Jesus just said it. If you are a true believer, you'll obey me. And if you our true believer who truly loves me by obeying me, here's my promise. I, with the Father, both of us together will dwell with you and live with you and make our home with you forever. Well, Jesus is claiming to be just as present and in fellowship with every true believer that the Father is, a claim of essential equality. Yep. And by the way, Biblicists, it's proston theon, not proston theos. 
the Ta end. Theon, the new at the end. But anyway, there you go. So I think we're, we're done refuting his distortion of John 1, I think, unless you have any other points or anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. If anybody has anything on their mind, feel free to ask. If not, we will move on to the outrageous, ridiculous statements of Abraham, the prophets, and Jesus being Muslims and not being Trinitarians. Yep. Anyone? Yeah. <clears throat> well, that was... Hello? Can yes, you guys hear me? Oh yeah, hear you great, brother. All right, all right. Uh, sorry. So I don't, I don't know if you guys are gonna hit this point next, but um, so I hear this all the time from Muslims: the whole, you know, show us where Jesus says he's God. Um, is there anywhere where Jesus says he's a Muslim? Like, is <laughs> I mean, you know, and I get it. I get Muslim means like submissive to God or Allah, or but I mean. Is there anywhere in the Quran or or the Bible where Jesus says like that he's submissive to God or that, that he's a Muslim? Do you guys know? Well, now you're confusing me, DJ, because your question, you're asking me where Jesus says I'm a Muslim or I'm submissive to God. Well, all throughout the Gospels, Jesus says he's submissive to God. Okay. That's the same thing as being a Muslim. So what are you asking? Okay. Well, I, well basically just flipping it, saying... Where does Jesus say he's a Muslim? Well, if, the way you defined it, you actually fell into your own trap. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I'm defining it properly, I guess is no, what I'm no, saying. It is. Muslim is one who to God. So if someone submits to God, that's what Muslim means. And Jesus does say he came to do the Father's will and only the Father's will and obey his command. So they'll say, see, that's what Muslim means. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying... If you're asking me to show you where Jesus claims to be in submission to God the Father, then that's all throughout the Gospels. And yeah, technically, yeah, I get that. I mean. So, but I wasn't sure if there was an actual, you know, because they they like to, to pull out, you know, where does the Bible say Trinity? You know, they they want to see the word Trinity yeah. in the Bible. So, is it, would that be a similar argument saying, well, where does Jesus say, Not I am a Muslim? In the Gospels. You told me, show me in the Bible or in the cross. They, I wouldn't have done it that way. So I, you I, in the I'm Bible. Not, Yeah, I'm not saying it more as like an argument. Like I want to use this as an argument against Muslims. I guess it's just for my just like personal knowledge. Yeah, well, if you're now, now I'm really confused. So walk with me, DJ. Just be patient because you went all over the place. Sorry. Is it for you, or is it for you and the Muslims that you want to witness? Uh, mo mostly for me, I guess I would say. Okay, now it's good. Well, if you define Muslim as submission, then yes, Jesus submits to God the Father. So in that sense, quote-unquote, he's a Muslim. But he's not a Muslim in the sense of Muhammad being a Muslim. Why? Because Jesus submits to God, his Father, and Islam, Allah is the father to no one. He's not the father of Jesus. Gotcha. But there's there's no specific phrase where he says, I'm a Muslim. Can't, well, you can't or, find the term Muslim yeah. in the Greek New Testament because the New Testament is not written in Sure, Arabic. it didn't exist at, at the time. Gotcha. Now, if you're now wanting to go to the Quran, yes. interestingly, in the Quran, Jesus never says, I'm a Muslim, but his followers do. Ah, uh, Okay. But gotcha. Jesus never says it. Gotcha. Okay. So you can't. No, I, show, I was curious. That's interesting. You can't show from the Quran Jesus saying, I am a Muslim. But the Quran does have Jesus' followers telling him, Bear witness, we are Muslims. For example, if you can go to chapter 3, verse 52 and 5, 111, brother. Chapter 3, verse 52 and 5, 111. And see. Now I don't know which translation. I don't. I don't use Arbery. Maybe Pictal or use. I've got Pictal up. Is that good? If he uses the word Muslims, if not, go to Yusuf Ali. Uh, let me see. Three fifty-two, right? No, let yeah, me go to Yusuf Ali. Five one eleven. Yeah, because it does. Uh, it does have in Arabic. They say, "Bear witness, we are Muslims." Yeah, here we go. Let me read uh, Yusuf Ali. When Jesus found unbelief on their part, he said, "Who will be my helpers to to the work of God?" Said the disciples, we are God's helpers. We believe in God. And do thou bear witness that we are Muslims. Right. Then and five the other one, 511. 
The other one, and behold, I inspire the disciples to have faith in me. And mine apostle, they said, we have faith. And do thou bear witness that we bow to God as Muslims. Oh, so, yeah, that's what the Arabic says. So Jesus doesn't say he's a Muslim, but his followers doing the Quran. So they can't, they can't show you Jesus' name, but they'll show you his followers. So that his followers said we are Muslims, but they didn't say we are Nasara, Christian, the Arabic word for Christian. Obviously, we don't care what the Quran says. But, yeah, Jesus in the Quran never says, I am Muslim. Just like Jesus in the Quran never says, I am <clears throat> the son of Mary, or I am the word of Allah, which he cast down to Mary, or I am a spirit from him, a spirit from Allah. Nor does Jesus say, I am the Messiah, right? What Jesus says is that he is an apostle of Allah and that Allah made him a prophet. What you can't quote Jesus saying, I am the Messiah, I am the son of Mary, I am the word of Allah cast down to Mary, and I am a spirit from Allah or a spirit from him. But he does say, uh, Allah made me a prophet and I'm an apostle. Right? But he doesn't say I'm a Muslim. So is that clear? Yeah. Yeah, no. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. A good question. Kind of confirmed, confirmed what I thought. You know, I'd, I'd never really, I don't think I would use that as an argument against a Muslim, but it's just kind of interesting. With no, you can use it, but this is what you ask them to do. Here, say, show me where Jesus in the Quran says, I am Muslim. And then say, yep. show me where Jesus in the Quran, in Jesus' words, even though I don't believe in the Quran, you do, where he says, I am the Messiah. And then show me in the Quran where Jesus says, I am the son of Mary. Show me in the Quran where Jesus says, I am the word of Allah cast down to Mary. Show me where Jesus in the Quran says, I am a spirit from Allah or a spirit from him. You can use that. Okay. But when you ask me the Gospels, well, Greek is not going to use the term Muslim, but it does say Jesus submitted to God, right? But anyway. Sure, sure. That's what I would do. I would turn on the Muslims and use that argument. Okay, so it is a good argument then. Yes. Okay. Those questions you ask them. Yeah, don't, you know, gotcha. Yeah. Where does he say, I am a Muslim, I am the Messiah, I am the son of Mary, I am the word of Allah cast down to Mary, and I am a spirit from Allah or a spirit from him? Because the Quran says all that without Jesus saying it. Even though Jesus doesn't speak in the Quran, they think he does. Right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Anytime, friend. And uh, just for the record, no T-Rex arms over here. No T-Rex <laughs> arms. Why don't you stop hating, sir? By the way, brother, uh, I think your mic might have moved a little bit. You sound a little bit muffled. Me? Is it just? Is it? Is it only me, or you, can you hear that as well, DJ? Me? Yeah, you. Uh, he sounds okay to me. Yeah, it's yeah. probably you. But I hope my sound is good because I didn't do anything. Okay. It, it could probably yeah. it's probably me, brother. I'm a heretic. No, it's all right. But I just want to make sure everyone. <laughs> my sound my, sound good, guys. Wait, let's let's do a sound <laughs> check real quick. Can we get a turchi tupi wali? Thank you, brother. Find me now. Okay. <laughs> All right, that song helped it. All right, so that was a good question, a good segue into the next clip. If yep. you want to, thank you, brother. Yeah, definitely, brother. So here's a little bit of humor. Put it down your throat and all that kind of stuff, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm really Follows only the followers of Prophet Muhammad will call Muslim. But a Muslim, the word Muslims come from Aslama, to submit yourself. So anybody who submits themselves to the will of their creator, who obeys the message of his creator is a Muslim. No matter right? the religion? No matter the religion. Because if you submit to your creator, there's only one religion, right? With well, the religion that Jesus followed is the same religion we follow. Right? People think these are different religions, but that's not true. Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, it was all one message, one religion. Right? People corrupt things later, but the original message is one message. Right? That's why we believe Abraham is Muslim, Moses is Muslim, Muhammad Muslim, and peace be upon all of them. We love, respect all of them. Right? People today will tell you Jesus is God, right? or they'll tell you he's the son of God. Or sometimes they'll tell you the part of God and they'll give you all kinds of different. But if you look at the original teachings of Jesus before the, the, the Council of Nicaea, before they gave the divinity of Jesus a, a, a voice, the original followers who were later on killed by other Christians, they believed in Jesus not being a divine figure, but being a prophet. And that's what we believe as Muslims. 
So Jesus and Moses and Abraham, all of them followed the same God, the same creator that we follow. All of Can you believe that, brother? Can, can, yeah, you, yeah. can, can you wrap your, 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 your... And by the way, he goes on and on uh, repeating the same stupidity over and over. But I, I really can't wrap my head around how, he, if you look at it, he's saying that with a straight face. Yeah, <clears throat> this is confirmation of what I said in my earlier session because I did a response to him again. And I said, the guy's a joke. He's a waste of time. Yep. He's one of the most ignorant, most pathetic Muslim debaters. Yep. He is so bad, he's on the level. And a lot of Christians don't know these people. He is on the level of Amir Ahmed, Osama Abdullah, Sami Zatri, Basam Zawad. These are the lowest of the low. They are from the, the dregs of Islam. They're so pathetically bad. And they're so arrogant that they think they're good. Yep. This is why I say he's a joke and waste of time. Now, I want to repeat. The only reason why I even addressed him is because Christians who don't know their faith that well were sending me re or requesting me to respond to him uh, because the state of Christianity is such. The catechesis of Christians is pathetic. Yep. Our Christian brothers and sisters are not catechized. So arguments like this affect them. Arguments that are so mm. bad Mm. that are so silly that a hundred years ago Christians would be laughing at this guy because over a hundred years ago we had people who are much more properly catechized especially if you go into early church history in fact brother you can even confirm wasn't it Cyril of Jerusalem who had catechetical lectures is that him catechetical Cyril? lectures brother we've got catechetical lectures we've got ecclesiastical histories multiple I mean really honestly this kind of this is embarrassing, but you know what, what, what is even worse, brother, if, and, and people can, they don't need to take my word. They can go to reason and theology, look up the debates that I've had against Shabir Ali or other Muslims, go to the comment section and you have people in the faith. You have Orthodox, you have Catholic, you have Protestant who are worried about this guy and want us to reply to him. This video, I found it because it was posted in a comment. So, uh, I mean, th there's terrible arguments, really bad. I don't think he's, I, I, I'm not being arrogant. I just don't no, think no. he's a worthy opponent. He's awful. No, no, you're right. You're being honest. You're not being arrogant. You're being honest. There's a difference between arrogance and just being honest. He's a joke. He's a waste of time. Yep. So then why are we wasting our time? For your benefit, for the benefit of our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, which is a reminder Learn your faith instead of spending time on channels by heretics, apostates, or anti-Christian or anti-Trinitarian. You need to be spending more time studying your Bible, meditating on it, living it out, worshiping Jesus, and going to bona fide teachers who love the Lord, proved of the Lord, to learn your faith so that when you're grounded in your faith, you'll be strong and immovable so that when you hear these kind of arguments, you'll laugh it off. The problem is you guys are spending more time on other things and going to channels written, you know, run by heretics without first knowing your faith. And that's why, again, this is why I ended up leaving, let's say, the Church of the East where Catholics leave, the Catholic Church for Protestantism, because they never took the time to study what their church believes to see, okay, let me first hear, I was raised a Catholic, let me go study the catechism, see why we believe what we believe. No, what they do is, they hear someone quoting the Bible. I'm not knocking Protestants. I'm just saying, yep. if you're a Catholic, stay in your tradition, learn your tradition. Then you can tell me, well, I studied my tradition and I learned my tradition very well. I'm not convinced of it. Yep. Not you have people leaving their tradition who don't, don't know a clue about what their tradition is. You see my point? Yep. Learn your faith. Be grounded in it. And then if you're still convinced it's not true, that's between you and God. But people leave without even knowing their faith. So we're doing this for your benefit. I don't waste my time with people like this. I don't. I'm being honest. Why? Not because I, in my arrogance, I think I'm better than him. You know, I know without Jesus, I'm no better than this guy. Without Jesus, I deserve hell like this guy does. It's Jesus who makes us savable and good enough to stand in the presence of God. And that's in Revelation 7. Amen. Verses 9 to 17. Read it there. It's by the blood of the Lamb that those who came out of the tribu tribulation who were given white robes 
could even be good enough and worthy enough to stand in the presence of God forever because of the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Apart from Jesus, I'm worse than this guy. May the Lord save him or give him what he deserves. Now, with that said, let's answer the objection. Everyone with me? Still, I didn't lose you guys, right? No, not at all. All right, good. <laughs> let's answer the objection and we'll be done. Was Jesus a Muslim? Was Moses a Muslim? Was Abraham a Muslim? Now, what he's trying to do is play on the term Muslim as a generic description. What do I mean by generic description? Generic description, because the word Muslim means a submitter. Islam means submission or surrender. So anyone who submits to God is a Muslim. And if I were to watch his videos, which I don't because he's a waste of time, I would be certain he would quote something like Mark 3.35. Because I have, I've had Muslims quote this against me. So let's go to Mark 3.35. He does, by the way. Oh, he does? He does quote it. Yep. Yeah, I didn't even know, brother. I swear I don't watch this guy. Yep, he does. And here it is. Mark 3.35. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. Okay, so see? A true believer is the one who does the will of God. And if you do the will of God, then you become Jesus' family. That's Islam. We do Allah's will and submit to Allah's will. That's Islam. See, Jesus said, be a Muslim without having to use the Arabic term. And another one they will use. Let's go to James 4, verses 7 to 8. And then let's, let's destroy this argument and we'll be done. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay, did you catch it? James says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. See, that's Islam. Islam means to submit. Alhamdulillah, even your Bible says to be a Muslim. All right, let's see what God's will is. What is God's will that God wants me to do? And what does it mean to submit to God? Let's stick with the book of James. The same James that he quoted. Let's go to James 1.1. 1, 1. Read for me. What is true submission to the true God according to the Bible? James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abro abroad, greeting. Okay, wait. A true submitter of God, who is a servant of God, is one who is a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. James 1.1. 1, 1. Now notice James on earth, a Jew, writing to Jews. And he tells them that a true Submitter, a believer, is a slave, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet when he says this, Jesus is in heaven. One thing a Jew will never do. A Jew will never be a servant, a slave to anyone other than God in heaven. The only Lord they have in heaven is God. But here he's saying God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Lord, both of them are my Lord. And I'm a servant, a slave of both of them. Does that sound like the Quran? Not at all, brother. Now let's go to good James 2.1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with respective persons? Uh-oh. James says, Jesus Christ, who is in heaven with the Father, he's not the Father, he is our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the Lord who's glorious. I challenge Muslims and anti-Trinitarians, especially Jews, show me a single place in the Hebrew Bible where someone other than the true God in heaven is said to be the glorious Lord reigning in heaven, the Lord who is glorious reigning in heaven over his people on earth. Show me that in the Quran. You can't find it. No. And yet here... James says the Father and Jesus, both of them are in heaven, and Jesus is our Lord. He is my Lord. We are his servants, his slaves, and he's the glorious Lord in heaven. So true submission, according to the Bible, is one who recognizes Father and Son as their sovereign Lord, and they are the servants, the slaves of the Father and Son who are in heaven. That's not Islam. That's biblical Christianity. Amen. But let's go back to Mark. Let's reread Mark 3.35. And, and one brief comment, brother, do you, do, do you notice how 
he tries to make Islam so appealing to people. Like, you know, it's so simple. You know, this is all that we're talking about. And that is how he tries to reel people in hook, line, and sinker. It is the motive and the actions of a demonic religion, brother. Of course. Definitely. Most definitely. Yep. Now, one more time, we're going to read Mark 335, because I want you to see, because he quotes it, right? You said he quotes it? He sure does, brother. All right. For, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Okay, so if you do God's will, you shall be part of Jesus's family. Now, let's see what God's will is. What does God require of us to do? Let's go to Mark 9. We're going to read verse 7. Mark 9, verse 7. Hope you guys are following with me. I hope you guys are not checking out. I hope it's blessing you. Amen. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. So Stop. God's will. God's will is what? Read Mark 9, 7. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Wait. God's will is to believe that Jesus is the Father's beloved Son, the Son whom He loves, whom you must hear and obey? Amen. Very clear with an emphatic, hear Him. So God says, here's my will. Here's my Son whom I love and adore. Hear Him, obey Him. Now go to John 6, 39, 40 for corroborating evidence. I use Mark to refute him because he quoted Mark. Now I'm going to bring John to back up Mark, showing that these authors agree over against Muhammad. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So according to Mark and John, the Father's will is everyone looks to the Son, trusts in the Son, hopes in the Son, obeys the Son, loves the Son, and honors the Son, not just as a prophet, but as God's unique Son, His beloved Son, the Son whom He loves, and then Jesus will raise them immortal at the last day. Does this sound like Islam? In fact, go to chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran. See what the Quran says if you believe Jesus is God's Son. The Jews called Uzair a son of God, and the Christians called Christ the son of God. That is a saying from their mouth in this, but they imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say. God's curse be on them, how they are deluded away from the truth. So according to the Quran, Allah will curse you and damn you if you say Jesus is God's son, the son of Allah. And yet according to the Bible... True Islam, true submission is to submit to Jesus as the Son of God, whom the Father loves, whom you must obey and honor like the Father. Because go to John 5, 22 to 23. Here we go. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father, he who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. So the father's will is that my son will determine your fate. My son will judge you on the day of judgment and determine whether you go to heaven or hell, depending on how you respond to my son. And if you want my son to grant you eternal life, you must give him the same honor that you give me. So wait, the father wants everyone to love the son just as much as they love the father. To pray to the son just like they pray to the father. To worship the Son and adore the Son just like they worship and adore the Father. To love the Son more than anything, more than their family, more than their wealth, more than their life, and be willing to give up everything, even their life, for the Son like they do for the Father. And that's Islam? So correct me if I'm wrong, brother, but according to the very Bible that uh, uh, Fib and Farouk holds up and, and shakes, um, you've got to give a particular honor to the son, and I don't see them giving any kind of honor. How can they honor the son when they say he's not the son? And not only honor the son, it says honor the son just as you honor the father. Well, you ask the Muslims, how do you honor God? Well, we pray to Allah. We sacrifice to Allah. 
we're willing to die for Allah. We are willing to kill for Allah. We're willing to give up everything for Allah because we love him more than anything. Well, Jesus said, my father wants you to give me that same honor. And if you don't, you're not a true follower of the true God. That, Jesus said, if you don't honor me, you don't honor the father who sent me. He's going to then reject you and condemn you. So what is true Islam? Submission according to the Bible, according to Mark and John and James. True Islam is doing God's will. What is God's will? God's will is you love Jesus as my son, whom I love and adore. You obey my son. You honor my son. <clears throat> you follow my son. You worship my son and be willing to give up everything, even your life for my son. Otherwise, you're going to hell. Let me show you where Jesus says you must love him and give up everything for him. Go to Matthew 10, read 37 to 40. And he then who loves, go ahead, brother, go ahead. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Notice he says, if you're willing to give up your family, your wealth, even your own soul, be willing to die for me, my sake, then you are truly my disciple. But if you love your life more than me, you love your family more than me, your possession more than me, then you're not worthy of me. You got to love me more than anything and unconditionally. But this is a love you can only give to God. And Jesus demands that love from all his disciples. Yep. Another one, Matthew 16. Let's read 24 to 27. And then I'm going to show Abraham and Moses were Christians according to Jesus. And Amen. then we'll wrap it up from my, my part. I'll wrap it up. You can continue, brother. You got it, brother. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So but Jesus did not say, you better be willing to give up everything for the sake of God. He says, for my sake, huh? Give up the world, everything in the world. Give up your own life if you have to, for me, for my sake. And so when I come with my angels in the glory of my father, then I will repay you accordingly. So Jesus is the son of God. God is his father, who is the son of man that comes with the angels to judge the living and the dead and to determine where they will spend everlasting life, either in his presence or away from his presence, depending on whether they love them more than anything. And this is Islam, the Islam of the Quran. Really? I don't think so. What so now, mockery. according to Jesus, was Moses... A Muslim like Muhammad was Abraham a Muslim like Muhammad or were they true Muslims in that they truly submitted to the Son of God whom they knew whom they hoped in whom they trusted in whom they loved, and was waiting for him to appear in the flesh let's see what Jesus says let's see what our Lord says go to John 5 45 to 47 and I'll wrap it up for my part my end after this John 5 45 to 47 do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Wait, I'm confused. Moses wrote about Jesus? And then Jesus says, therefore, if you truly believe Moses, you got to believe me because Moses is writing about me and pointing you to me? interesting how can Moses write about someone he didn't know well obviously he must have known Jesus in order to write about him which means Moses knew Jesus and trusted in Jesus according to Jesus not me according to Jesus now let's go to Luke 24 25 to 27 here we go then he said to them 
Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Moses and all the prophets knew of Jesus, spoke of Jesus, and wrote about Jesus. Interesting. So then let's read same chapter, Luke 24, 44 to 47. Almost and done, folks. I hope I didn't put you to sleep with this. This is my mind-blowing stuff, brother, mind-blowing. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. So Jesus says, Moses wrote about me. The prophets wrote about me. The Psalms mentioned me. They all knew of me, prophesied of me by the Holy Spirit, and were trusting in me and waiting for me to come in the flesh. And if you still doubt that's what Jesus is saying, go to Matthew 17, verse 3. Which is found also in Mark 9 and Luke 9, but we're going to go Matthew 17, verse 3. And behold, Moses and Elijah appear to them, talking with him. So Moses and Elijah even appeared in visible form as disembodied spirits, because physically Moses, his body had been buried. But he's alive as a spirit in a spiritual shape by which you could still know that's Moses. They appeared and bore witness to Jesus and spoke to Jesus. So that means not only did they write about Jesus, so they knew about Jesus and prophesied about Jesus and waited for Jesus and hoped in Jesus and loved Jesus and trusted in Jesus. They even show up visibly before the very eyes of Peter, James, and John. Because notice what John, Peter says in verse 4. Yep. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if you wish. Let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So Moses and Elijah appear in the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus is transfigured, where his face shines like the sun. That's what verse 2 says. And his white was whiter than any bleacher could whiten them. And then a Moses and Elijah appear. And right after that, in verse 5, we're told that the Father descends in a cloud, in a visible cloud that Peter, James, and John see visibly, and then speaks in an audible voice that Peter, James, and John hears audibly and says, this is my son whom I love, hear him. So what more do you want? Moses and Elijah bear witness of him. God the Father bear, witnesses of, bear witness to him. And they're all telling everyone, listen. Follow Jesus as the Son of God, whom the Father loves, and obey Him, and you will be saved. That's true Islam. Two more examples to wrap it up. Wow. Amazing. Let's go to Mark. Yeah, yeah. Let's go to Mark twelve thirty-five to thirty-seven. Two more examples to wrap it up. For me, for my end, anyway. When I say wrap it up, for my end. Then Jesus answered and said, "While well, He taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the Son of God, of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit." The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? Okay, so Jesus just confirmed the Holy Spirit revealed to David that the Messiah, which Muslims and Christians agree is Jesus, the Messiah is Lord. And so David, by the Spirit, worshipped him as his Lord, calling him my Lord, and wrote, a psalm confessing the Messiah as his Lord. You caught it? Incredible. Final one. I can go on and on and on, but this is the final one because already I've spent over two hours and I know my brother has stuff from the church father, so I'm, I don't want to hog the attention because, you know, I'm, I'm all alone. I need a lot of attention. But anyway. And, and by the way, Too brother, the, 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 the stuff that I will share... I will send it to you. It will be on John 1 from the Fathers. I'll send it to you. You uh, can yeah. even post that on your blog. Yeah, I will. I'll post it as a, a post on my blog. I will do that. Awesome. Okay, so notice God has blessed us. 
He brings the fathers and I bring the scriptures that the fathers knew like the back of their hand. May we be like them in Jesus' name. Amen. We try to be like the apostles. We try to be like Christ. And now, final one for my end. John 8, 56. Mm. And we're going to read all the way 59, but let's read 56. So you, let's sink in. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Wait. The... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Abraham saw Jesus, knew Jesus, rejoiced in Jesus, was glad to see Jesus, which means his hope was in Jesus and he loved Jesus and he trusted in Jesus. Read that again. Let me, uh, I don't know why people do that. Okay, here we go. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Well, this only makes sense if Abraham knew who Jesus was. I'm not saying the name, the person that we now know as Jesus in the flesh. Knew who Jesus was, trusted in that Jesus, hoped in that Jesus, loved that Jesus, and rejoiced in that Jesus. And that's what Jesus just said. Now notice 57 and 59. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going to the midst of them, and so passed by. And so Jesus says, Yes, I did see him, which is why I know his reaction to me. He saw me and I saw him face to face. Do you know why? Don't let my physical appearance mislead you. I'm much older than 50. Let me tell you how old I actually am. As a man in the flesh, I'm not yet 50, but I'm more than a man. And I existed before I became flesh. Here's that word again, before he became flesh. I was around before Abraham was created. I was there when Abraham was created and I continued to be long after Abraham died. So, yes, I saw him face to face. So I know his reaction to me when he saw me because I was there to see it because I've always been and will always be because I'm that eternal word that became flesh, the son of God, God Almighty, Thomas is Lord and God, and he's our God and Lord too, and we love and worship the Father, Son. There you go, guys. Brother, a Muslim could never accept the clarity of scripture of those ancient words of course but that's why he's going to say your bible's corrupt which proves our point and by the way brother you had up to 450 at one time 480 people you still got over 300 may your numbers increase for the glory Amen. Of jesus. may our numbers increase for the glory of jesus so that we can get more people to learn this for the glory of christ pray for me and my daughters that god will give me the health i need to stay healthy my daughters to be healthy pray for their salvation my holiness to truly love the lord and obey the lord Amen. Pray for our provision and pray for our reunion that Lord willing, I'll see them sooner than later. And God willing, I'll see you again. And the Lord Jesus loves you. And may we be in love with him. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. God bless you guys. I'll see you brother. Amen, brother. I'll see you very soon. You take care, brother. Everybody remember to pray for Sam, pray for his beautiful daughters. Remember, pray for everything positive about uh, our ministry. Uh, thank the good Lord. Uh, I didn't know we had uh, such numbers, and uh, Sam says they're still pretty good right now, which is great. More and more people watching, which is awesome. I imagine more more trolls as well, though. Even though I have not been, yeah, DJ's nodding his head. Even though I haven't, I have not been looking on um, on YouTube. Usually, when Sam goes, I do start looking, but um, uh, I imagine more trolls as it grows and grows. We will definitely be getting more people that show up that troll. Uh, it's fine. doesn't really bother me at all. Uh, let them get bothered. Because now what we're going to do is we're going to delve into your early fathers to make their, their, their skin crawl even more, to get them even angrier. You all saw the video where Fib and Farouk was making a fool of himself, claiming that in John 1, the logos, remember the Greek word for in John 1 is logos, the word. That very same word utilized in Luke, where the word came to our Immaculate Mother, and Mary heard the word, vouchsafed the word, kept the word in her heart, 
that very same kind of language is being utilized here. We find that in John 1. In the beginning was the word. That word, as we're shown later on in the very same gospel, became flesh for our sake. That word is identified as Christ. So to then, to then try to argue that John 1 is not talking about Christ is, to be kind and instead of saying stupid, ludicrous, ridiculous, terrible argument. What we're going to look at now, and indeed we've got a ton of stuff to look at, we don't have time to go through all of it because I don't want to keep you all here till the wee hours of the night, but I will give Sam this article so he can post it in his blog. We'll go through enough fathers to make the point that we're looking at the Bible, and even though the text from the Bible is very clear to show that Fib and Farouk is foolish when it comes to utilizing the I don't even know what his real name is anymore. It's called him Fib and Farouk. Um, to show that he's foolish and terrible with the way he utilizes, the way he butchers the Bible, he's a butcher. With the way he butchers the Bible, we've shown from the Bible grammatically, we've gone over it. We've looked at clear, the clear language here. We've examined the Greek for y'all, which by the way is a ton of fun. I always have a fun one. I always have fun when I get a chance to look at the Greek. I have a blast. And I, I love the fact that I can be able to sit down and examine it with a brother Sam. A ton of fun. We've looked at the Greek. We've looked at the clear context. We've looked at the grammatical construction of the original languages. Now we arrive at the fathers, a double whammy or triple or quadruple, whatever you want to call it. At the end of the day, we do, we make it a point to refute the heresies from the Bible and then bring the fathers in as a backup. We were told earlier that this wasn't believed until we got to Nicaea. But indeed, even though we will be reading fathers post Nicene era, we're also going to be looking at fathers before the era of Nicaea. Now, one thing we've done here before, and we'll do it again in the future, we've shown how the apostolic fathers taught how Christ was almighty God. They taught the doctrine of the Trinity. They were Trinitarians. I mean, we can do that all day and all night. I can name drop apostolic fathers like Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, the Didache, Polycarp of Smyrna, Massetes. The Epistle to Diognetes, we can go on and on. But the point is to show that Fib and Farouk's interpretation of John 1 is a terrible one. Not to do what we've already done before and show how all of the early fathers were in unanimity in interpreting Christ as almighty, eternal God, and in their belief in the doctrine of the Trinity. We've done that before. We'll do it again in the future. Tonight, our point is, before we conclude, to examine and bring in the fathers and show. John Chrysostomos, as you may know, incredible Greek father, a father very deeply revered within Catholicism, within Orthodoxy. While all the other evangelists begin with the incarnation, John, passing by everything else, his conception, his birth, his education and his growth speaks immediately of his eternal generation. His eternal generation. So what is John Chrysostom, by the way? Greek orator. He was nicknamed the golden mouthed one because he was considered one of the greatest orators of his time. Saint John Chrysostomos interpreting John 1 as detailing the eternal generation of the Son. He, number one, identifies the Logos as Christ and then shows that what is being spoken of, of that Logos, is his eternal generation. Of course, we're reading about the eternal generation because later in the Gospel of John, we arrive at the incarnation, at that word. We'll go there at that word becoming flesh. And the logos, the word became flesh. 
let's go to the Greek. Because earlier we showed you the Greek. In John 1.14, so that you can realize the very same word talked about earlier in John 1, in 1 John 2, and elsewhere. Now we're in John 1.14, where, of course, Fib and Farouk doesn't want to examine. We're going to look at the Greek, which Fib and Farouk, in his wildest dreams, could never examine it in the Greek. Instead, he's got to come up with a stupidity that, well, it was written in Aramaic, and we don't have the Aramaic originals. And the word became flesh. Kai ha lagos sarps. The word, the lagos, the word right here, the lagos became flesh and dwelt among us. That very same lagos that he denies. Well, let's hear him in his denial. Uh -huh. By the word, and the word was with God. Uh -huh. And the word was God. Where's Jesus? <laughs> Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? The word, not Jesus. Show me Jesus. It's right here. <laughs> so his laughter is, in, is indicative of one that loves to mock the fate. But even better, he wouldn't have laughed like that in front of a knowledgeable individual. He noticed the man didn't know the material and notice the man was walking away. Therefore, he begins to laugh and say, that is talking about the word. Show me Christ, he wants. And Fib and Farouk has probably read the Gospel of John. You know, I get it that he's horrible. Doesn't he call it the Book of Palms? It's terrible. The guy's terrible. The guy's awful. But I don't doubt he's read John 1. He knows the Logos is Christ. What he's doing is he's utilizing a bit of rhetoric there to try to then mislead the people to play a little bit of trickery there. Because he wouldn't use this argument against one that, had, that knows the Bible even relatively well. Credit to him. He can sniff it out when people don't know their Bible. So, you know, you got to give credit to him for that. But then again, he's been there. He's there every day at Balboa Park probably all day long, he can tell when people don't know, they begin walking away. But it's very clear grammatically, contextually, whatever you want to say, the Logos is Christ. The early fathers interpreted the Logos is Christ, and we're going to continue for about, about half an hour or more to hammer the point home. Why? So that this video can be recorded, and you all can go back to it for your edification, whatever you need to look at the fact that we buried those arguments biblically and from the early fathers as well. Look, Fib and Farouk doesn't know who the heck the early fathers are. Did you catch that stupidity that he claimed? Well, the early followers, they got, they were murdered. Uh, you know, what early followers were murdered and which ones took over? I mean, the early followers were murdered. Of course they were. But they weren't murdered by some kind, of sub, uh, some kind of church that then took over in their place. They were murdered by pagans, by non-believers that demanded they submit. And quite the opposite of what he thinks, demanded that they reject Christ. And they didn't. They went to their death for our Lord. So the idea that those that first followed Allah, Christ, that they were Muslims and they were murdered by people that then subverted their religion and made them believe in Christ is outlandish, is ridiculous. Look at Ignatius of Antioch. He was a Trinitarian, Polycarp of Smyrna. I just did a show with Dr. Howell. I don't know if anybody got a chance to catch that. Go check it out. Great show. The guy's incredible, man. Yeah, hundred percent recommend watching that video twice. You like it, brother? Great. Watch it twice. It's so awesome. beautiful, the way he talks about the Eucharist. Uh, Amen. Yeah, I mean it. It almost brought me to tears. How beautiful our 
our faith is. Amen. Oh, amen, brother. And, and for people wondering, I will be refuting Fib and Farouk probably, I'm not sure when this week, on the Eucharist, the way he attacks the Eucharist. I will be ripping that to shreds in a few days, brothers. So great video. Go check out the video of the interview I did with Dr. Howell, where even if you're evangelical, you're Protestant, um, go check it out because he affirms what we've been telling you from the beginning. You can trust the early fathers. Dr. Howell is a gentleman who has, um, he's translated the most ancient of documents from the Greek, from the Hebrew, from the Latin, into English. He's done an incredible job. He plans, I believe, to re-release them. He's amazing. He's just incredible. So the that idea, that kind of teaching that comes from Fib and Farouk. Hey, hey, brother, we yeah, uh, go ahead, we bro. got a Muhammad in, in the in the chat. In here. In in the chat, yeah. A Zoom or YouTube. On YouTube. Oh, invite him in. Does he have the guts to come Let's in? Let's go. Come on in, brother. If, if, if you have got the guts to come in, defend your Muslim faith, come on in. All you got to do is look there. Look in the description. There is a link to join. Come in. Defend your Muslim faith. Defend the faith that has no basis in ancient history. I doubt it'll happen. But if it does, I would be shocked. Is he, is he being a troll, brother? Um, he's, he's just popping off, saying love for his messenger of Allah and blah, blah, blah. So... Not, not, not surprised. Uh, if, if, if he gets, uh, puts on his big boy pants, hopefully he'll come in here. Although I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't count it. Augustine, Augustine, who was a thousand times the man that Muhammad never was. There are two births of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one divine and the other human. Consider that first begetting. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Whose word? The Father's own, which word? The Son himself. The Father has never been without the Son, and yet the one who has never been without the Son begot the Son. Hilary of Poitiers, I will not endure, I will not endure to hear that Christ was born of Mary unless I also hear. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. He argues that because they go hand in hand, to hear one and to not hear the other would be tantamount to the ridiculous heresy found within Islam. You know, really ridiculous. You know, Hilary of Poitiers, well ahead of his time, able to view and able to foresee the kind of horrible heresies that would come down, that would attack, and that would attempt to subvert the faith. We don't find a hint of Islam in the early church. Well, we can find hints of it within the condemned Arians, but not even there. What not even the Arians would have lined up with, with, with Islam. Not even they would have, you know, Arius would have condemned Muhammad. Even at that, Arius would have condemned him. We go onwards. Eusebius of Caesarea. Who beside the Father could clearly understand the light that was before the world? One thing that comes up very prominently and that heretical groups like Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, Mormons, they cannot deal with the utilization of light. The New Testament, the early fathers, they hearken to that eternal light from the Book of Wisdom, that apologasma which was utilized in the early fathers and the early councils and what have you to emphasize the eternal nature, the eternal generation of the sun, the intellectual and essential wisdom that existed before the ages, the living logos that was in the beginning with the father and that was God, the first and only begotten of God, 
that was before every creature and creation, visible and invisible. The commander in chief, this is important right here. The commander of creation, you find fathers, you find it utilized in Justin Martyr, where they grab that terminology found in the book of Revelation, which is distorted by Jehovah's Witnesses. And they point out how Christ is the beginning, the arche in the sense of being head, chief, commander over creation. And indeed, we have, look at what we have. Chief of the rational, immortal host of heaven, the messenger of the great council. What does that mean? The angelos, the great angel. Note how we've done shows of the angel of the old covenant, the angel of the Old Testament, the angelos being Christ. Christ appears as an angel, not as a literal angel with wings, but as a messenger, one that was sent from the Father. He is called the angel of great counsel, prince of peace. All of the early fathers, the earliest interpretations, recognized him as that great angel before he became incarnate, which dialogued with Moses, which led his people out of Egypt. All of the early fathers recognized this from antiquity on. We've had this ancient interpretation. The great council of Antioch, which was a precursor to the council of Nicaea in the year 268 or nine, I don't quite remember. We've done shows on that before though which was a preview of what would come at the Council of Nicaea. They declared Christ as opposite to what the heretic Paul of Samosata was claiming, that he was created. They condemned that and noted how he was that logos, that eternal word, that great messenger, that great angel. We find it as early as that early ancient council where Old Testament Christology is clearly preserved. I want to look for, uh, we've got a ton of fathers here. Let me look for one, one particular one that I thought was a very great reading. Let's go back to Chrysostom. Heretics, he argues, say that the words in the beginning was the word do not denote eternity, eternity, absolutely. So notice one thing. The heretical individuals at the time of John Chrysostom, they might have been heretics, but they weren't foolish enough to have argued that the Logos was not Christ. Rather, they tried to argue against the eternal generation of the Son. They realized that they were toast. They knew the Logos was Christ, so they tried to take the argument in another direction, but that didn't work either. They would try to take it in another direction, away from the fact that the clear teaching of John 1 is that Christ is eternal God. But they didn't try to deny that it was Christ, as Fib and Farouk does. Ambers of Milan, in the beginning, we're told, God created heaven and earth. And the world was therefore created, and that which was not began to exist. And the word of God was in the beginning and always was. Augustine. The Greek word logos signifies in Latin both reason and word. However, in this verse, the better translation is word. So that not only the relation to the Father, the relation of the Son to the Father is indicated, but also the efficacious power with respect to those things that are made by the Logos, by the Word. Reason, however, is correctly called reason, even if nothing is made by it. Augustine. And there's a ton that can be read. Basil the Great. We'll look at Basil, we'll look at Ephraim, then we'll look at Tertullian. Basil, our outward word has some similarity to the divine word, for our word declares a whole conception of the mind. Since what we conceive in the mind, we bring out in word. Indeed, our heart is, as it were, the source and the other uttered word, the stream that flows from there. 
Ephraim, who is providing a commentary on, on Tatian, the Diatessaron, and incredible, by the way, anybody that is, um, uh, if you are a Syriac Catholic, Chaldean Catholic, Oriental Orthodox, or even Eastern Orthodox, Ephraim is, a, is an incredible father, incredible, and we all claim him. Uh, what do I mean by the fact that we all claim him? Um, the kind of theology you find in Ephraim is compatible with all of our, all of the ancient, the ancient faiths. Now, when I name, name ancient faiths, of course, I named um, Oriental Orthodox, Eastern, and Catholicism. Ephraim, an incredible early father from a different part of the world. So we're talking about fathers that write in Greek, and now we're talking about a Syriac father, a doctor of the church, one of the greatest doctors of all, our Lord. So well, look, look, Fib and Farouk, if he tries to argue, well, you know, you know, you got a bunch of Greek fathers or Latin fathers like Augustine, who cares? They, they didn't know Hebrew or they wouldn't have known the language of um, anything out, outside of Latin or of, um, or of Hebrew or of Greek. I mean, Latin or Greek. You've got the great Ephraim writing in a different language, in a different region of the world, recognizing the Catholicity of the interpretation of John 1. What do I mean by Catholicity? I mean the universality in the interpretation of John 1. Our Lord is called the Word, the Logos, because those things that were hidden were revealed through him, just as it is through a word that the hidden things of the heart are made known. Tertullian, he's, he's got a lot to say, but we'll, we'll read a little bit of Tertullian. Certain people affirm that in Hebrew Genesis begins, in the beginning God made for himself a son. Against the ratification of this, I am persuaded by other arguments from God's ordinance in which he was before the foundation of the world until the generation of the son. For before all things, God was alone, himself his own world and location and everything. Alone, however, because there was nothing external beside him. Yet not even then was he alone, for he had with him that reason that he had in himself. His own, of course. And what is that reason? This the Greeks call logos. So whereas Tertullian would later formally leave the church and fall into the heresy of Montanism, Tertullian was very much in line with believing that even though he wasn't very um, precise at times, his Christology was perfectly fine. Even though at times he tries to define things in a certain way so as to remain within the realms of orthodoxy. Unfortunately, later, he formally leaves the church, becomes a Montanist, and ends his life outside of the fold of the Holy Catholic Church to which we don't have any evidence that really, we really don't have any evidence he re returned. The great Athanasius, the incredible Athanasius, the Arians whisper, how can the son be word or the word be God's image? For a human word is composed of syllables and only signifies the speaker's will and then is over and done with. But the word of truth confutes them as follows. If they were arguing concerning any human being then let them exercise reason in the human way both concerning his word and his son. For such as he that begets, such of necessity is the offspring. Whatever the word's father is, the word also must be. And so much for that argument that comes from Fib and Farouk of the claim that God had a child, that we believe that that we believe that God actually had a physical child with Mary, that God the Father, of course, implying, implying that there was a, the act of sex and whatever that we supposedly believe, all of these ridiculous things. But God is not like humans, as Scripture has said. God is, exists, and has always existed. Therefore, also his word exists, the Logos, and is forever with the Father. Notice what we get to right here. As radiance accompanies light, 
that theme found very often in the early fathers, you can find in Tertullian as well, found in the book of wisdom, which the early fathers hearken to, found in the New Testament, particularly the book of Hebrews, found at the early councils, and definitely found in the early fathers. Since time is running out, I, I'm going, I'm trying to see which ones I like to, oh, Methodius of Olympus, and another incredible father. You will find Trinitarian theology very, re repeated very often in, in the great Methodius. The words, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, that one will not err who says that the beginning is wisdom. For wisdom is said by one of the divine band to speak in this manner concerning yourself. The Lord created me, the beginning of his ways for his works. Of old, he laid my formulation. It was fitting and more seemly that all things that came into existence should be more recent than wisdom since they existed through her. Now consider whether the same in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Whether these statements are not in agreement with those, for we must say that the beginning out of which the most upright word came forth is a father and maker of all things in whom it was. And the words the same was in the beginning with God seem to indicate the position of authority of the Logos, which he had with the Father before the world came into existence, beginning signifying his power. And so, after the peculiar unbeginning, beginning, who is the Father? He is the beginning of other things by whom all things are made. So even though we encounter a lot of... Um, poetic kind of language, even when you roll back that kind of poetic language, you have clear Trinitarianism being taught, clear the deity of Christ being taught in a very clear fashion. Prudentius, who's a father you don't really hear often about, he's not very well known. There, there, there are quite a bit of fathers who, when you open up the Patrologia uh, Grece, or Latina, or a Syriac one, you find figures that really, maybe you don't really have a whole lot of stuff translated about, or we don't know a whole lot about. He would be one of the ones that we, we really don't know a whole lot about him. We don't hear a whole lot about him. We don't have, uh, you're going to look him up online and you might find a ton on Augustine, but you're not going to find a ton in him. We have that for a number of fathers. It doesn't mean that they didn't write in a voluminous manner. It means that we don't have a lot of what they wrote. One of them that comes to mind would be Theotechnos of Livias, who I've done shows about, who was an early father who talked about the Dormition of Mary. He's a very significant figure who, if you've watched my interview with Father Brian Daly, you find how this particular father talked about the Dormition of Mary. He was a Greek father, also talked about the Immaculate Conception. So when we, when we say, I'm not going to go too far off, but it is relevant because there are some fathers like Theotechnos that talked about the Immaculate Conception. Now, when people wonder, they've heard me argue many times that you don't need the actual language of a conception for a father to fall in line with that ancient teaching. You can have one like um, Gregory the Wonder Worker or one like Hippolytus that would talk of the creation of Mary as being one of the immaculate nature. But then you've got fathers like Theotechnos, which are very clear that talk about the actual conception. You have a number of Greek fathers that do that. Romanos, Theotechnos, John of Damascus. But I'm not going to go too far off. Prudentius reminds me of Theotechnos in that we don't have a whole lot of their writings. But nevertheless, we have orthodoxy in what we do find in them. Though you came from the mouth of God, 
Born is his word on earth below, yet as his wisdom you lived forever in the Father's heart. This wisdom uttered made the sky, the sky and the light, and all besides, all by the word's almighty power were fashioned for the logos. The word was God. Even an, a father who you don't hear a whole lot about, who maybe he only wrote a few tomes, maybe he didn't. Even a father that was obscure, church father, was more intellectual, was more in line with the ancient faith than Muhammad and, then, and more than Fib and Farouk. He clothed himself in mortal flesh that by arising from the tomb, he might unlock the chains of death. In there alone, you've got multiple refutations of the horrible heresies of Islam. Clothed in mortal flesh, he's our incarnate God. By arising from the tomb, unlock the chains of death. He bodily rose from the dead. I mean, you can't even make it up. You just look into the early church and the refutation of Islam is right there. There's no reason anybody should be converting to Islam. There's no logical reason is what I mean. There's no logical reason anybody should be abandoning the faith of the ancient fathers, the faith of Christ. A hymn for Christmas. By the way, Fibon also attacks Christmas, which I'll be getting around to that as well. I'll be getting around to refuting any time Fibon puts the ancient faith in his mouth and attacks it, I will be refuting him. I guarantee it. Not because I view him as a worthy opponent. I don't at all. But we have people that are bothered and that really want to see something out there refuting the horrible heresies found in his stuff. Now, we will wrap it up in about 10 minutes, but uh, before uh, I'm going to take maybe a 15 to 20 second break to only get up and walk right over there and get a drink. I will be back in one moment. All right, and I will, I had not been paying attention to YouTube. How many people we have? So we still have over 200 watching, great. Awesome, everybody, God bless you. I am looking at uh, YouTube now. Sir Bourbon tells me that Prudentius wrote many hymns. Very cool. Uh, I wonder if a lot of them are available in English. I am unaware of them. Uh, I am unaware of them being available in English. Very cool. I'm looking in the chat comments before we wrap up. In case anybody does have anything on their mind, I will take any questions before we do wrap up. Um, looks like we still have some trolls just looking. It's, you know, the one thing that is unfortunate is we, we got so many trolls, but um, but none of them had the guts to join. I mean, if you're going to come and you're going to troll... You know, you figure that you 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 join and try to argue. Yeah, they just drive bys. I mean, it's really about it, brother. It's drive bys. <laughs> they don't they don't have the guts to join and to yes. you know. Hey, well, I I learned a long time ago. Uh, my Bible teacher told me he's like, don't just don't just believe something. You know, own what you believe. Don't just know it, but own it and stand so you can stand up for it and defend yourself. There you go. You know, don't you know so when somebody somebody comes and questions you well, well why do you believe that have an answer you know amen but but these guys they just come in here and popping off and then they uh they disappear yeah so i agree uh mickey uh, uh bekele did you have anything on your mind yeah yeah hi william that's my first time in zoom 
So Wonderful. I'm, glad, I'm glad, glad, glad to hear, have you here. Thanks. Uh, so my question is like, you know, when we say like God has like three persons, what's the term person mean? Like, Very good question. So, and, and I would, what I would recommend you do is go look at my, I've had a number of debates with, uh, with Muslims, with Shabir Ali, uh, with Shadid Lewis, with Mushraf Hussein, where I define what we mean by personhood. So the most recent one I did was on the Holy Spirit, whether or not the Holy Spirit is God. So your question is a fantastic one. What do we mean by person? Do we mean a human being? Do we mean uh, an individual that has to have a physical body? No, we don't mean that. What we mean is that a person will have certain attributes. So when we mean personhood for the Holy Spirit, for instance, we mean that we're shown that the Holy Spirit has certain emotions. Now, we know God doesn't literally have emotions, but in order for our limited human intellect to grasp what is being shown to us on the text, we're told that the Holy Spirit grieves, we're told that the Holy Spirit uh, has anger, we're told that the Holy Spirit has love, we're told the same for the Father, we're told the same for the Son. Um, another thing that indicates personhood would be intellect, would be will. We're told the Holy Spirit has will. The very, the very Greek word utilized for the Holy Spirit having will is indicative of that word utilized for Yahweh having will as well. Um, intellect, will, um, uh, consciousness. teaching ministry, consciousness, teaching ministry. So there, there, there really, there's kind of like really a number of things there that would indicate personhood, Miki. But the one thing that we want to not argue is personhood is not tantamount to human person having a body or being embodied. Does that help at all? Yeah, it was it was great. Thank you so much. What uh, if you if you don't mind me asking, Miki? What uh, what faith are you from? Oh, uh, Catholic now. Wonderful. I was, great. Yeah, I was Protestant like, but now uh, I just I just uh, turned to Catholic like last Easter vigil. Now, uh, amen. Incredible, brother. You, you've made the right choice. Um, are you, are you, if you are not on my emailing list, make sure to email me so you can get, um, you can get, uh, you can join us and zoom each time. Yeah, that would be perfect. How, 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 how can I get like your email? So stuff like I will put the email right here. Um, I put it right there in the chat. Okay, Ca cool. I got it. Thank you. Cur Colonel Quayle wants to know. Uh, very unrelated question, but I'll touch upon it. The thoughts on um, state of the church and the priesthood. <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, the, the state of the church has been like it's been from the beginning. You know, we have some really great people in the church. And then we've got some really terrible people. It's been like that from the beginning. For people that are worried and they say, well, William, I am overwhelmed by all the you know, the heresy, the bad people in the church. Guy, open up 1 Corinthians, man. Paul was pretty ticked off as well. 1 Corinthians 3, he's mad that he has to return there and go over the same stuff over again because they're not paying attention. Uh, Clement of Rome, we, you know, it's right back at it to the Church of Corinth. And, you know, it's been like that from the very beginning. So uh, will it change anytime soon? Probably not. We're human beings. We have a fallen nature, and we are imperfect. The priesthood is great. There are a lot of incredible priests, man, a ton of incredible ones. So look for the good ones, follow the good ones, follow the good theologians, and you'll, you'll be great. It's my best advice. Yeah, just just remember the uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Amen. So, you that, know, the that, ho Holy Spirit will guide her and keep her going, you know, and it, just, you know, sometimes you got to shop around for, for a good parish, you know, yeah. as, as a good, uh, good clergy. No doubt. No, no doubt. Very, very good, great advice there, brother. Sometimes you got to look around to try to find a parish where you fit in, but whatever you do, don't abandon the faith because of a few bad rotten apples. I mean, 
if it would have been that simple, you, you would have had multiple and tons of Tertullians. But Tertullian sticks out like a sore thumb because he was one of the few luminaries that formally left the church. And it is a tragedy to this day. The others, like the great Athanasius, all of these other great fathers, they held firm to the faith to the very end of their lives. Yeah, and just to kind of add on to that, you know, we need to pray. We need to pray for our bishops, our priests, the Pope. You know, we need to pray that they lead holy lives. You know, if if they start failing, that's on us. You know, yeah. we really, we got to pray for them. Amen. No, amen. Um, I, I, I see we've, um, it's unfortunate when we actually get Orthodox trolls that join. It's very rare that we usually get. I see one one Orthodox troll uh, that is there, um, which is unfortunate because I, I, we've even got Orthodox moderators. So, uh, but hey, I'll tell you this, Alwina, uh, you're free to join the Zoom uh, whenever you want to try and make your claim, your claim that uh, Catholicism has failed you and that only within Orthodoxy you can find the truth. Uh, I, you're going to have a real, 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 real tough time with me proving that. But um, like I said, I love my Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters, even my Oriental Orthodox brothers and sisters. I love them, even though my Oriental Orthodox brothers and sisters are a pain. I mean, they're a pain. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're a terrible pain. I love them as well. Um, and then my Eastern Catholic brothers and sisters are also a pain, but I love them. I love all of them. Even, even the Protestants. I even have Protestant mods. All you guys have been great. With that... I don't want to keep you all longer. We've been doing it for three hours. We've had an incredible time. Love all you guys. If you are a Trinitarian, you're welcome here 1,000% of the time. You love Christ. I love you. Pray for me. Be praying for you. And we're doing more shows this weekend. Um, I'll be sending out emails. So I will also be sending out some books tonight or tomorrow. So if you're on my emailing list, you are in luck. Everybody, um, yeah, Rusty. Well, Rusty's saying Oriental Orthodox of pain. I'm, I'm saying it in a joking way. It, it is an inside joke, a very, very, very inside joke, because um, I've got some very, very good Oriental Orthodox friends. In fact, uh, one of my co-authors on our book on transubstantiation was an Oriental Orthodox. So it's totally an inside joke. I love all my brothers. Everybody have an incredible evening. God bless all of y'all. Talk to y'all soon.